Yes, check it out, man. Uh, I'd like to say uh, we are back. Uh, fuck this COVID shit and all that, as That's you guys right. know. Uh, you know, we, we took a little time off. We're back here. Uh, Rabbit Season podcast, man. And we'll be launching. Uh, most likely it's going to be every Friday morning for your drive to work. But uh, we have new releases and all that. And uh, my name's Rabbit, by the way. Yeah, Shay Whitey, producer. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah, man. And we're, we're here. And uh, we got our next guest, man. And this is a good homie of mine. Um, doing very important things with the music and all that stuff and uh we're gonna get right into it man my brother george miller jr what's up man yo what's good man i came in pretty loud hey man it's great to be back here at home base man i yeah. mean we'll get into the reason why i say that because you know we've been knowing each other for a minute i even had a, my own little show here for a while too so yes. uh, we're gonna get into all that we we got to talk about all that because those were epic bro like yeah, those, uh, were cool. th those were real real epic shows people still talk about them man so hey i, I wanted to ask right off the bat because um, you know, during all this, you know, obviously downtime and stuff, um, you know, I haven't really seen you that much and you're around like even when we <coughs> randomly do for those that don't know the B side show every Monday night, a hip hop based show. George is, you know, he's here a lot of the times just chilling in the back. He just comes to kick it. Um, but I haven't seen you in a cool minute, man. How you been? What you been up to? Bro, I've been great, man. Um, you know, everybody talks about this pandemic and the opportunity they see or maybe the opportunity they don't take. But I took full advantage of this motherfucking, um, yes. uh, you know, pandemic when it hit. Plandemic, I'm going to say. Um, you know, the shit hit hard like in what, uh, February, March, I think, and everything. I got laid off my job in April. I think, yeah, it was. that's when it really hit the hardest. It yeah, was April. Supposedly around since the prior year at the end of the year. Yeah, but some yeah. people say they had it before. It even, it even I believe it, man. Like, like me and, me and, uh, me and uh, Homeboy were talking about uh, – Last year, like around this time, November, like I was out sick for like two weeks, bro. It was like some of the, it was like one of the worst flus I ever had. Hey, and hey, thank, I'm glad you brought <coughs> that up because same here. Um, and, and I took off more time than I usually do at work. Even, yeah, and man. That's how bad it was. I was yeah, like, I was, I was out for like two weeks, bro. And and I usually get bad congested bronchitis, and that's what I had. But enough about talking about being sick. Uh, let's talk about, yeah, in April. So I get laid off, and um, you know, as you guys know, or. You guys don't know who I am again. My name is George Miller. I'm a I'm a I'm a soul record collector. I collect um, 45 RPM singles. Uh, you know, sweet soul music, low rider, oldies, whatever you want to call it. And and can I and I mention uh, you've been doing this for a long time, man. You've been in this game. Yeah, man. Um, I've been in this game before it was even actually a game. <laughs> like I've been in this before it was nothing. Like it was just a handful of guys who were just collecting because I don't know. It was just it was just a thing to do, you know. Even though I was young, bro, I was like 17, 18 years old. Um, the reason how I got into collecting records, this is like back in 1994, 95. Uh, I was, you know, growing up in East LA, Pico Rivera, Montebello, Whittier. You know, of course, you're Chicano. You listen to oldies, you know. And my dad and my mom, you know, they're they're from different barrios, and that's that was the soundtrack of my life. Oldies, doo wop, predominantly as well. So um, my dad and his homeboys, you know, as I got into the teenage years, I started understanding more, um, you know, the words and the meanings of those songs. You know, as I started becoming older, like 13 years old, I remember uh, my dad would used to make mixtapes, you know, just like a lot of people do in the neighborhoods, you know, who had records and record players and tape recorders in the late 80s or early 90s. You, you know, you hear stories about how each hood you know, like the certain guy who was a record collector and representing that neighborhood was making they mixtapes. They had their own, like, soundtracks. Yeah, 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 yeah. You had yeah. certain neighborhoods that had a certain style and a certain sound. Um, and it was a lot of it was... And if you had... The, the more underground it was, like, the more downer or, you know, the more, like, intrigued people were, like, talk about that barrio for their music, mm -hmm. you know? Because I remember, you know, my dad's neighborhood in Pico was notorious for, like, their doo-wop. You know, because they had Ruben and my, uh, and Puppy and and my dad, who were the collectors, you know, making these tapes for their neighborhood and 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 people in the neighborhood were like buying the tapes off of them. So I grew up like kind of watching that happen, and uh, in the background, you know, I'd always listen to it. So as Tho I got those were literally the the sound like again soundtracks of like when when back in the day you'd have your fr the the house parties at the crib mm -hmm. your homeboys would come over the home <coughs> a bunch of you know ladies dudes chilling right people come over and, and they they either play the records or 
you know, the tape players were really popular. It was a lot easier to just pop in the tape and let that thing play, you know. So a lot of the tapes, it wasn't always doo-wop, but it was predominantly my dad's specialty and his homeboy puppy's specialty was rare, like rare, like New York doo-wop, L.A. doo-wop. Just that really authentic, like gangster sounding, set apart from your radio type oldies, you know, doo-wop. And there was other neighborhoods, um, you know, around like Hazard and Frogtown and, you know, just different neighborhoods all scattered throughout L.A. who 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 were talked about for their oldie tapes. Like it was real shit. Like it was it was a real thing. You would literally hear other neighborhoods talk about other neighborhoods about how dope their fucking oldie tapes were, you know, like, oh, shit, that this neighborhood has these jams, that this one has these jams. So it was kind of like a buzz that was going on back then with the doo-wop, not necessarily not necessarily so much soul music. But, yeah, they would tap into the soul music. But the soul music I remember back then that my dad and his homies and, and other people were playing was that real, like, um, B-side type oldies, like Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. But, like, something that wasn't on the radio. Yeah, like, not the like not, not the, the main hit. single. It was, like, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was, like, on the album, like, mm. some other, like, dope-ass ballad that was, like, just insane you know, or like some intruder shit or some Delphonic shit, but just on some different level type shit. And I Blue know magic. And I know even from, you know, obviously our show being called the B-Side Show, that was, pr you know, through the hip-hop side. Um, and, and I'm going to speak because I know they correlate. The B-Side was sometimes, to me, oh, uh, most of the time, harder than the original single, the main single. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I think that's what set the tone for the new for the new sound coming in because uh, you had you know like the art of bow the huggy boy all these yeah. you know, the common top 40 shit and then you had those neighborhoods who were playing the, the b-side and as you said the b-side had the, the more hardcore jams the more like you know heartfelt music um so that's what i grew up listening to in the early 90s you know i was i was as i was a teenager late 80s early 90s growing up finally when i'm a teenager i'm finally like you know dating girls or whatever and i'm finally like listening to lyrics and like oh shit like that's just like just the whole mood the harmony everything is just making sense to me hey, I so this is what they're talking about. it's talking yeah, yeah th these songs hey, are talking to me now and i ain't gonna <laughs> lie i probably used you know a couple oldie lines in my day you know right, what I mean? right. Some, smooth, <laughs> some smooth shit like i hope i hope she didn't hear this song so. yeah <laughs> hey yeah, but i took this line from that <laughs> jam <laughs> hey hey let me ask you though because then you know uh fast forwarding you obviously at a young age uh, being around your parents with with these musical soundtracks being you know oldies and rare oldies specifically right but, um, fast forwarding did you start because I, I've known you a long time and we'll get up to that point too but um, did you start collecting the oldies before because I know you were a DJ at like house parties and <laughs> stuff like that too right Wh was that before or after or during the whole process when it, you, you know what man the 90s was fucking epic bro. yeah hell yeah like it was epic oh, yeah, it was. Like I, I, it hey, was, miss it, I feel I'm it. glad to say I was there. Yeah, man. <laughs> I, you know, I'm 45 years old right now. In 1990, 1991, that's when we were in high school. I was my freshman year was like 89, 90, and then 91, 92 was my sophomore year. 93. I'm class of 93. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, not behind you, 94. <laughs> so in in the night in the early or in the very early 90s, man, I was into everything because what happened was when I was around that age at 13. That's when my 14 years old, that's when my parents split up. Mm. So um, when my parents split up, um, I was raised. I mean, okay, well, let me go back real quick. My dad was from a neighborhood in Pico Rivera. My mom was from a neighborhood in East L.A., in the white fence area mm -hmm. of East L.A., over there on, like, Whittier and Lorena streets. Yeah. You know, that's where she grew up. I know exactly where that's at. So um, as when when I lived in Montebello for up until I was about, like, 10 years old, and I went to Montebello, like intermediate and, uh, you know, the schools in Montebello. And then my parents got out of the neighborhood because um, we used to live with my grandmother in Montebello. You know, we were staying with my grandmother. My mom was and my dad. And we were living there until my mom and dad got there. We got their own spot. We had a spot. In, I remember we got a spot in Rosemead, but we only lived in Rosemead for like so long, maybe like six months to a year. It wasn't that long. And then we moved to West Covina when I was about like, yeah. 10, 11, 12 years old. So I went to, uh, I started like sixth grade in, in West Covina at, at um, Merced Elementary School. That's where I went. Um, so we're in um, West Covina, California, and um, my parents split up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in high school now. I'm like a freshman. My, my parents split up, and my dad moved back to Pico Rivera. And 
you know, my mom stays in the West Covina house that we're living in. So every weekend I would go to my dad's neighborhood, you know, my dad would pick me up, whatever. And I would be with my dad on the weekend. And, you know, I was around, my dad was like free. He was, you know, single, whatever he was, he was, had more freedom. Um, my dad was also, uh, it's, it's known out there. My dad was uh, a heroin addict, a functioning heroin addict. You know, um, he had, he held the job his whole life, never missed a day of work. Uh, it's pretty crazy. You know, him and all his older homeboys were all heroin addicts. And, um, yeah, man, they just had a passion for that doo-wop music. So as I was getting older, I started, I started listening to this, my dad's tapes, you know, we, everywhere I'd go in my dad's truck, everywhere he'd, we drive around wherever he's bumping his music he's singing in the car like he's like he just had a, a huge passion and it really impacted me and i started listening to the lyrics i was older now understanding about relationships love my parents split up i'm starting to like you know see girls especially like someone you <coughs> look up to to see the passion that he has for i mean it could only mm. rub off on you bro. oh yeah like, definitely rubbed yeah. off on me man my dad's singing yeah, like in the car while well you got yeah, yeah, like he's like going crazy. Like it's it was kind of funny. It was comical, but you know I do this, dude. <laughs> here I am, you know, twenty years later in my car, like right, you know, jamming out, bro, like singing these songs. So hey, when I'm singing in the car, <laughs> nobody could tell me I'm off key, man. I'm right exactly. I'm in the yeah. pocket. Yeah. So I finally shower. understood. It. You know, my dad be hitting the steering wheel, like yeah, yeah. he'd be feeling that shit, bro. Yeah. So um, so yeah, man. Definitely, definitely, my parents influenced me. I, I wanted to say something because we're gonna we want to continue uh, your musical journey, but just something really interesting to me is that part is like, you know, this is a real part of life that I've seen as well, and I'm also somebody that's I mean I'm not heroin or not, yeah, you know, uh, but I've s you know grew up seeing, you know, obviously you s you see the the ones that are not so functional with it, yeah. Don't do you know? Oh yeah, my, there was a lot of homeboys yeah. in the neighborhood oh, who were yeah. definitely. But but I I grew up like dog like fucking tweakers and shit. Right, and, that and, too. And and, and I, but I knew ones that they'd go to work every fucking day, bro. That maybe, was my dad. Maybe party all night, not get too much sleep, <coughs> still go to work and and you know me like you know I I, I drink, but I, I don't drink like you know hard liquor or nothing like that. I gotten a lot better, but speaking uh, of which, but yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> no, no, but also. Uh, uh, we, you know, weed and 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 stuff, and I I go to work every day, bro. But I right. I just thought that's something interesting that you said because even though he did have his vices, like it didn't stop him from providing, you know, exactly doing he what he had to do right. for the family. Exactly, yeah. he was a good man. He provided yeah. for the family. He went to work. He had a good union job. Yeah, you know, so he had good insurance. He he made decent money, and um, yeah, man, I looked up. He he was a functioning addict, and he had a really expensive habit, bro. I don't know I, yeah. to this day. I mean, I do know why. I, it's a whole other subject, bro, that I won't even get into about how I helped my dad, kind of get money to even like support his habit, bro. It's mm -hmm. like some crazy shit that um I used to do on the weekends with my dad, to like, you know, support his habit because he had like a two two to four hundred dollar a day like or a week habit with oh, that shit, geez. you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I and I only mention that because yeah, every you know, um, we a lot of people have their their demons and their and their vices and stuff, but like I, I think sometimes people are quick to <coughs> judge and like it doesn't make them a bad person. It's just we all deal with different <coughs> our, uh, things our own ways. So exactly. Yeah. But at least he was still handling business, bro. Right. Mm -hmm. And back to your original question yeah. about like uh, how did I how did I juggle it all? Yeah, you know, yeah. It was the '90s, you know, so. Um, you know, like I said, I lived in West Covina. I was a freshman in high school. I was there was party crews going on. I was skateboarding. See, I was there uh, too. I was surfing. <laughs> I was like playing two on two. It may sound corny, but I was even playing volleyball. Like two on two was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to go to the beach and play that did shit. Did you play handball in the handball court? We d uh, I, that <laughs> we did do that, but like that didn't really stick. That was more yeah. of like remember that, that was happening in La Puente <laughs> a lot, bro. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> I remember those those courts were packed. Yeah, like bro. Right yeah, we we lived down the street, the dog. So we would see. Yeah. <laughs> I remember in Puente the hand the handball courts were were jumping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not so much in West Covina in the nineties. It was like predominantly, it wasn't as 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 Latin oh, as it is but now. You know what though. Um, yeah, and see, because uh, the the party crew days, I was around that time, and and also, you know, one thing I've always found dope about, p in particular West Coast, because it's all SGV area is what we're kind of talking about now, but um, it was always like the black and brown unity was pretty pretty strong, dog. There was yeah, even I remember, yeah. there was even crews that were right. made up of black and brown. Yeah, there was like uh, I remember a crew called Lab Latin oh, Asiatic yeah, those Brotherhood. Oh yeah, homies, dog. I yeah, I remember too. Lab. Yeah. Uh, the dance crews, Future Two Thousand, the Lords, 
Oh yeah, they they used to be one of the dope dance crews. They were they were yeah. deep, bro. Like they were they were repping hard or for the SGB. Even, uh, I've met even black cholos, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Where we live, yeah, <laughs> there is, dog. Could there was a few. Come up and ask me for a trajo. <laughs> exactly right, <laughs> <laughs> black dude. I need even so play it, dog. Who's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, people that are d- that are gonna tune into this, man? They'll they'll know what we're talking about, man. There's there's usually some in in almost. Uh, most hoods, there's like one or two. So <laughs> I, I was I was introduced when the 90s hit and I was a teenager, bro. I was introduced to it all. Like it was all front and center for me. I was in West Covina. And like I said, I would go back to Pico. Uh-huh. And of course, I had my friends and my homies from when I lived in Montebello in East L.A. That I would when I went to Pico, like I would go visit my homies as well. And, you know, uh, that's where I kept my hood side, I guess. You know, I mean, I'm hood all the way to the core no matter what. But in West Covina. You know, I, g- I met a lot of white friends and we started skateboarding and doing like, you know, surfing. And I, I was I was doing that. We got in the party crew. So I was doing it all, bro. I was surfing, skating, fucking volleyball, playing oldies. But and then and then in the party crew time, uh, I eventually started uh, joined the crew and then we started. DJing. I was just going to say that. And then comes the that's when you started spinning. That's when I started DJing de- uh, house music and, and techno. See, we, we talked oh, about you did that, too. I yeah. didn't know you're doing house. No, music dude, because yeah, yeah. Look, look, dog, this is dude, like I used to spin. I uh, started to cut you no, off. Go, go. There's a guy in the soul scene right now who I go back in the days with. He was DJ Cazelle. Oh, I remember because I knew bro, him. I've been to a bunch of parties dude, that he DJed. rocked. He was like my age. He went to and the sh- same school. You as know I what? Shout out to him because he's still doing his thing. Yeah, yeah he went up. to the school we yeah. went to. Yeah, yeah, Kazal, dude. Like, yeah. so uh, I looked up to Kazal, Modern Romance, all these guys who were DJing. Mm-hmm. Like, I wasn't as big as they were, but um, I did mess around DJing, and it didn't really work out for me. But I did start DJing house, and I did do a few parties because you know my party crew, um, you know. I, I, we had our own DJs in our party group, Jungle George, mm. and um, here, I'll here, let me let me do this real quick because yeah. I got something to say. Hold right. on, I gotta take a drink. There it is. Oh, what a rush! I was gonna say is is tell my brother that back in those days when the party crew days, like we used to have all the flyers, dog, because our crew, dog, we we used to have we used to throw yeah, a man. gang of parties or at least be part of them. We even did something. I'll get into that a little more later, but where we would throw parties with people and not even say it was us. Right. And then we would just direct people to the same right, party. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Just because, like, you know, so that way uh, you just move politics just don't get involved, all that stuff. But right. but what I, what I was going to say is I remember back in those days, because we used to get all the fly, we'd be at parties and everybody remember handing out the flyers right. hand to hand. Oh, yeah. And I remember seeing this dude. W- I didn't know it till later, yeah. which we're going to lead up into that, too, when I met him years later in studios and shit, but... I remember seeing your DJ name, or you either throwing the event, or one of the DJs. Yeah. Uh, what was your name back uh, then? I had a really. I was pretty famous in the in the San Gabriel Valley. My yeah. name. Uh, I was I was more of a known at this time with this name. I was more so known as a like a promoting entity. Uh huh. Mm. But my name was Curious George. Yeah, yeah I remember see? you talked you talk about that back in the day, yeah. and I was like on every fucking flyer yeah. yeah and the reason why is it's kind of funny is because if you listen to my podcast uh on soul 101 podcast which we did here mm, at the yeah. b-side shop yeah, that's right. thank you guys yeah. about a, two years ago yeah uh, i brought my friend danny mart you know danny oh, sales yeah. on yeah and my friend danny in high school um he was one of the guys who got into the printing business like at, in ninth grade like he literally was we literally set out to conquer the party crew world and Eventually, he became a graphic designer, and he started printing for everybody. So basically, the main printers by 1992-93 was Liquid Image, which is Danny, and there's Alex A. Printing. Mm. And I knew both. I knew I was really cool with Alex A. Printing, and of course, my f- my friend Danny was like my homie. Mm. So my friend Danny is making everyone's party crew, bro. If you're in the San Gabriel Valley, like chances are you went through Liquid Image to get your flyer done. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he would always ask the crew members, Hey man, is it cool if I put my, my homie's name like hosted by Curious George, or could I just put my homie's name Curious George yeah, like yeah, on the yeah. flyer, Mystique Dynasty on the flyer? So that's how my name got everywhere is because these people were agreeing like, yeah, I don't care, like throw his name on. So it's crazy my, because my name was on every flyer, bro. Yeah, but it's George. in those days like you just trip out on the difference of the technology compared to now. Like everybody can make their own flyers now. Right. Own, they only got a two printing places. That's yeah, like yeah. Everybody got to go to the same exactly. People. And everybody did. I remember that too, man. And uh, and and so that's. Uh, what I just wanted to get into is even then, um, when it wasn't so much just based on on the oldies, which you built such a foundation of, 
Um, but you were out there, man, at all the parties, either involved or actually there. Right. Either spinning, I had hosting. A, we had – that's when my entrepreneurial mindset yeah, kicked in. Yeah, exa- okay, that's what I wanted because to get into. Yeah, because of the party crew days, be being so young – and looking at this as a business, because my parents are split up now, mm-hmm. and I got all this freedom. And me and my friend Danny, like, my mom was a, a, a working mother, you know. She didn't right. really have the time to watch me. Right. And when I was 16, 15 and a half, bro, I got my fucking per- driver's permit, and I already had – I was blessed that my mom gave me her old car, which was a 79 Cutlass Supreme. Oh, okay. So I already had a car with the permit at 15, and I was already out. In the street, hey. mobbing. See, and that's why we we relate because I was the same. <laughs> I, I got mine right away. My mom also, single mom, mostly raised us, and and she was e- working or what whatever dog, and and so I I kind of you know, and I'm not faulting her. It's just the times that yeah, the ti- that's what the times were like. If you want to survive, bro, uh, with single parent household and all that, and so I was off doing whatever I wanted. Same here, bro. And so my mom would lend me her car, and yeah, a yeah. Cu- couple times I fucked up, and she didn't lend it to me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm the dude in <laughs> high school building the name in the party crew scene, and I have a car. Yeah. Um, dude, having a car was like b- the golden child back in the oh day. Yeah. Oh um, you yeah. were the homie with the car, like. Psh. Everybody's calling you. What are you doing yeah, Friday up? night? What's, cra- hey, what's yeah, going what's on? Going what's on? cracking? Hey, <laughs> and, and I was, I was partying, bro. Like I was like, let's go. I was yeah. all about it. Like let's go. So, um. I understood the dynamics of the business aspect of these party crews because we were charging like two bucks at the door, or whatever, to you know whatever we had for the jungle juice we would make. Oh yes, and that was another ad. Or so and even uh, later on, the Nas balloons oh, the and all yeah, that. Yeah, shit. that, that yeah. came into play later yeah. on. Yeah, but the early early nineties was just it was more innocent. A, a, as I think in ninety four ninety five, that's when all that Nas and jungle. Ju- I remember jungle juice was the yeah. shit though, man. Yeah, man. So. In the party crew days before the oldies, I, and, and during this time, during these techno days of me being involved in all these parties, bro, I'm bumping fucking natural high out of my fucking. I'm going to parties, bro, and I'm not. Aries usually bumping that yeah. the party music, right? Or, or dunk, the dunk, 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 dunk. I'm 15 and a half years old, bro. Pat, my car's got like seven, eight people in it. People like lapping it, uh-huh. and I'm bumping like fucking natural high, bro. Like full fucking. I had a system on my car, like. A little, not a loud system, but I had a pretty loud system, man. Like, it was bumping. Yeah. I'm bumping oldies, bro. I'm moving Delphonics, Blue Magic, because of my dad's influence, you know. And I didn't give a fuck. We're vibrating on each other's yeah. laps. Hey. It, hey. I mean, it wasn't all night, but, I mean, I would definitely throw in those oldie jams, bro. Like Tri- we Trip out on this real quick, and we'll get back into it. But, do you, Che, do you remember when I had that? Uh, it was a 60. Three or sixty-four Impala, yeah. but it was a <laughs> four-door. Uh, but it was a four-door, marijuana. and I bought it's it off this old dude that was. It, it was all smashed in the back, bro. Uh-huh. Like it needed major, like a whole body redone, and he sold it for cheap, and I bought it, bro. Fuck, dude, it was like a, like a dead giveaway nowadays. If you right. if I was rolling, and here's the thing, I threw my speakers in the back, so all the people that would roll. They would be in the back with their legs up. Yeah, you couldn't even put your feet yeah, on the ground. But nobody shit. cared. And But I had a this and Paul, and I'll be bumping hip how we be rolling. Yeah, yeah. And here's the thing, though, for a life. I, ha- I owned that car for like a year and a half. I never been to so many party backyard parties. We even went to raves. Oh, yeah. And the whole time, bro, it I never registered the motherfucker. Oh, you were it never dirty. had tags, dog. The whole time. It didn't even have an old tag on yeah, it. Dude. I just rolled, You're dog. You just rolling dirty and, as fuck. And, and, and this dead giveaway <laughs> car. <laughs> I only got pulled over literally about three times, and each time, luckily, luckily we weren't let faded. You go. No, we weren't faded, and I and I said, "Oh, I just bought it. And right. I'm taking it to the crib." Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. But it was just crazy because I, that fucking car went to so many events. What color was it? Brown? What color was no, it? No, it was like a like white, a white, like an off white, like an off okay. white. Yeah, kind of I think, I, think like I remember seeing that rolling around that car because it, it was all smashed in the back, and it was four door. The whole back, well, on the driver's side, the I'm whole sh- back was smashed in. Like, you'd see the rear fender, uh-huh. and they would know it was me. Like, literally, that tank, that car was like a tank. Right. I remember we'd get faded, and I would roll from, we'd go through roadblocks. Like, just because we were, yeah. uh, you know, do yeah. I don't condone this behavior, right. kids at yeah, home, if you're listening. listening. <laughs> 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 but I, would different. I would, yeah, I would show the homies, i go, hey, check this out. I, I thunk, just thunk, and yeah. it, nothing would happen did to you the ever car. See, did you ever see a Volkswagen square back, like a powder blue rolling at any event? Those, those are, that was around, I do too. remember that. We both drove that one to <laughs> probably my, my homie had a, a square back, yeah. a, 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 a red one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to go hey, to the beach on that shit. On that I, d- I gave that down to Shay when I, would, when yeah. I was in high school, and then he drove that. Yeah. And here's the thing, dog. It had the, the, the motors and those things are in the 
inside yeah, you, of the you car. You could feel the heat. Yeah, yeah. In the back no, seat. But mine wasn't sealed properly. So even in the oh rain, man. sometimes we'd have to roll the windows down before we died of carbon oh. monoxide poisoning, <laughs> dog. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, like, she, she chewed me out that night thinking that me and my friend, like, because we all came with red eyes, that we were smoking weed in the car. I, I, I was only 17. But it was just the exhaust had gotten everybody's <laughs> eyes. <laughs> 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 you know, I yeah, was man. smoking weed at the time, but that day I didn't actually. Hey, right. We're probably brain damaged to this day. <laughs> but Damn. Uh, hey, dog. hey, so le- let's go, man. So uh, obviously from, from going to all the parties, um, you were very active. Very, Nin- very active. 90s were fun. 90s were fucking fun, bro. I remember very I fun. Yeah, man. I, like backyard parties. I remember yeah. the first time ever going to a ditching party playing techno music and then all of a sudden like the the music stopped and a brand new song came out that took the nation by storm man and it was fucking nirvana's pink spirit and oh someone yeah, played yeah, it in yeah. the backyard i was like what and everybody started going crazy bro like Smoke jumping off the roof yeah i remember the dude had a, a pool table in his backyard and they destroyed the pool table everybody's cracking each other with the fucking pool stable pool oh cues <laughs> oh. <laughs> sounds uh, like a good time yeah, a really inspirational like song <laughs> yeah man yeah, <laughs> they would go back to playing the techno and shit like, but they threw in the nirvana every now and then it was crazy oh man those what those a mashup bro that it, was the, all the all those that's again one of the things and i've talked about on our hip-hop based show though the 90s it did have that where you can be at an event and hear about five four or five genres of music right. and all everybody still stayed on the flo- oh dance yeah, floor yeah yeah Everybody's and, uh, still like fuck yeah. To techno, it, you know? like you said, there was house, uh, hip hop, uh, rock. They would every oh yeah, they, they were uh, definitely new wave. Even the new, new wave. Sh- oh, new wave was hot, man. Oh, D- DJ man, Earthquake, dog. shout out to DJ Earthquake. Yeah. That dude was playing like the new wave back in the day. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 the uh, cla- the K rock classics. What I trip out on too is that like you know how we talk about this stuff now, and uh, I've talked about this with your kids, those, those party days. But like we all became homies later, but there was probably so many parties we were probably at the same party and just didn't, didn't even know, know each it. Other yeah, yet, yeah. Like you know. It was like well, yeah, man. So blinking, like, oh. exactly. So those party crew days, man, really laid the foundation down for my my entrepreneurial spirit, I guess, because I've always been business savvy. I've always been. I've always had the cutting edge on how to promote. I've always had um, these kind of qualities about me to where I could get a party cracking. Me and my friend, bro, we would just. In a week, we would fucking create this party, give it a name, and it would be like all the parties cracked no matter what back then. But, I mean, we just had that natural knack to like get parties cracking. A- after about a year of doing backyard parties in like 93 now, we even leveled up and we started m- we started maturing and we started like really going after the money. And we started like doing clubs, but like. They weren't real clubs. They were makeshift. It was like pizza joints that turned into a club. Or, or even or warehouses became warehouses. into play. Like back yeah, all then. ages type so of this, right? I'm only like 17 at this time now. Yeah. And, and, you know, I have headsets on. It was like state-of-the-art bullshit. Me and my friend Danny were like in like nice clothes. And like we're like um, we're like the ones throwing the event. But we're low-key. Like no one really knows that it's us because, like you said, certain politics get involved. So you don't want people to, because then if people know it's you throwing the party, everybody wants to get in free because I knew so many people. Oh, that was another. So I couldn't really, like, be at the door or hey, any of that shit. Isn't it great to see that that trend still exists? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For real, right? Motherfuckers still want to get in free to, I don't want to, or give me, hey, I see you're putting out gear. Can I have it for yeah, free? Yeah, yeah, let me get a shirt, bro. Yeah, like, uh, it's all good, though, man. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this ain't nothing new to me, man, what I'm doing here, you know, 24, 25 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe fucking. 30 years later, right? Fuck. Just adapting to technology. Is yeah, different. just adapting to, and to the see, scene I'm in. And then that's something that, you know, uh, uh, myself, I uh, like, I'll give myself, I don't give myself much credit, but for that, uh, kind of adapting and moving forward, but always still wanting my hand something to do uh, on in this music right, scene. Right, you, you, you stay forward thinking yeah. and progressive. And, and, you know, even at the time when we created B-Side Show, yeah, there was other shows before us. I'm not going to act like there wasn't, but at the time, there wasn't a lot, and to this y- day, I know that we have um, we've inspired a few shows. I know that because right. we ten and years. And, and, and those shows, when you started B side, where are those shows now? Did they did they weather the storm or did they fall uh, off? Uh, most of them, I never, I don't know what happened. <laughs> they See, so that says a lot. It's a lot, a lot of work, bro. Uh, you you know that already oh yeah. though too. Hey, hey, See, so here's one thing I wanted to say though. Um, uh, around those times, like my brother just said, is we we probably. We're at a lot of the same parties. We probably knew each other then at some in some I'm sure we did. Yeah, in some form or fashion. But then, you know, fast forward not too long, a couple years later, um, I know myself because I, I was rapping, you know, and stuff since high school and all that. And then 
um, like the battles and the different the stuff. I, I would yeah. even yeah, there was I even was in battles and then. So how did you what what did uh, I'm gonna turn the tables here? What got you into rapping? Like, do you remember why you even started like spitting bars? Uh, I've always been into rap since it started. You know, I'm pretty much the same age as it uh, officially, pretty much. Yeah. And um, you know, I've, I I was a break dancer and all that. I moved but like, like you, I skateboarded and everything. Yeah. But I wasn't one of the skaters that played new wave or any other. Right, right. I played hip hop when I skated right. and different shit. But always been into hip hop. And then the more and more I got into it, uh, like I started like actually writing stuff. And then the homie, shout out the homie Drac too. He's actually still our partner here at this spot that we got. The B side, man, uh, yeah, and um, because of him, actually, and he invested in a beat machine. Okay. We turned the house I lived in at the time, the garage, into a studio, Dope. and it was on ever since. But that's why I think that helped because I don't know how I would have gone about it if I didn't have somebody around me that actually took the initiative to get a beat machine. And I so say, now, hey, let's let's do now. This. Let's go. Like I now, there's no <coughs> excuse. And just being there with them too. That is, um, I think one of the things that inspired him is, um, he's always been into like uh, lyrical content and a lot right. of stuff yeah. was coming out that wasn't very lyrical what so year like was I this I could do so he's like i could do better than this 96 97 no, er, way earlier oh, than okay. that yeah okay. early 90s when i started but but it was a, a, like don't not saying there wasn't a, um, a lot of lyrical content in the 90s but what my brother's referring to is is more more on of the, your the age underground level. and no, also the underground that. scene um yeah. we weren't seeing a lot of that and and um it, the shows we were going to and stuff like we, oh man, and then so lyrics has always been important to me, and that's kind of what. So you would go to shows and be like, yo, like I could totally do this. Oh yeah, so yeah. So that's and that was even at an early age, but and, and the same with you. But then later, see that's the thing, and then I end up in studios, and I go to different studios. I met a lot right. of different artists, which is uh, again why our platform has legs to stand on is because I got a lot of networking going through all these years and. One right. of the one of the um, relationships that was built was us, dog. Like I met you at the homie studio, and I believe it. Was, I don't remember. If, I don't think it was steak night. For I think it was in Blunt Studio first. C Blunt. Yeah, yeah the homie C Blunt. Shout out to C Blunt, what man. What up, homie? I haven't, I haven't talked to him in a while. I either. have not seen C Blunt since. Uh, well, I used to fuck with C Blunt for years. So I mean, I th- it's been at least a good ten. Maybe even fifteen years now, bro. I've talked to him on the phone a couple times, but yeah, I haven't I and I got to get down there because I I know he said he's picked the studio back. He's still doing the shit. I think the last producing. time I saw Blunt was probably like two thousand eight. Jeez. Yeah. Two thousand seven even. Yeah. Something like that. And 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 uh, I met you there, and we were making beat, and this is how Blunt was making beats. Yes, like we were all making beats. But but you came, and this was the thing this is the twist that this is why everything correlates bro. okay let like them know let them know how yes, we met and, and, and the, the hip-hop shit like we're in there making like hardcore like hip-hop tracks and, and those of you listening and george th- comes into play yeah those of you listening man this is a, a hip-hop based forum like you're probably scratching your head like why is this oldie 45 soul guy even like being interviewed right now a- and this is like the link right here and and i remember you telling him hey bro i got and you were telling us in there, I got like rare fucking, I got rare music here. Besides being oldies, and people don't get me wrong, people did sample a couple things back in the day, but they weren't sampling the underground, not the no, underground I had. And and they weren't actually producing with the sample. Is that fair right. to say? Yeah, because with the they would basically use they would chop it up to. They death, would use bro. the sample as the main shit of the beat, whereas later I think it kind of developed where the sample along with the producer would create something s- like right. like a, a collab a mesh like right. you said a mashup i i had a certain sound i wanted uh-huh. with the samples i brought to him i didn't want the the soul song because the soul songs i had okay this is 2005 around, uh, around okay. there right yeah this yeah. Is 2005 when i went to Blunt. Or 2000 well i was doing hip i was Marijuana before i met you the memory. i started messing around with hip hop beats and all that because um and th- yeah, 2003, I was with this other record label. We totally skipped like 10 years, you know, because we jumped right to the 2005 section. But hey, uh, uh, marijuana yeah. affects the memory. During my journey, okay, let me go, re- let me rewind to the 90s real quick and just run through what I did. So the party crew we kind of covered, my entrepreneurial mind, you know, kicked in, partying, um, you know, having the upper hand in promoting and, and doing all that, right? So I'm listening to oldies, I'm skateboarding, uh, and I'm skateboarding like, 
at almost like a professional level at this. At this, I, I was doing all kinds of, you know, I was like shop sponsored. I was skating with the guys from, uh, you know, Outhouse, which is now called the Pawn Shop. Oh yeah, yeah. that's still um, the, yeah. Yeah, I was skating with those dudes, and I was skating with prof- even professionals. Man, I went to like Lance Mountain House in Dewardy. He has like a big old Powell and Peralta. Yeah, Powell Peralta. I used to skate with those dudes. Uh, Guy Mariano, uh, Rudy Johnson, Gabriel Rodriguez. Rest in peace, Rudy. Uh, uh, passed away like two years ago. We heard. Uh, sad man. Those are those are La Fuente skaters, Guy Mariano and and well they're from LA, but I think Guy lived in, in La Fuente. So uh, skated with Brian Majeska. These are just some names that I skated with. So that's all my '90s shit. So um, I'm now like 16, 17 years old, and now you know I'm um, buying records. You know I'm going to record stores with my dad and his friend, and now I'm buying records, doo wop. I'm buying C. I was going to I was just first I was buying CDs like. You know, the whole entire group, like Black Ivory, Con in the Four, uh, Lee Williams and the Symbols, like the whole entire group, because I wanted to learn everything they sang. I might have heard a song, like on some compilation, like Soulful Things. I might have heard a song like I'll Be Gone by Lee Williams and the Symbols, and I wanted to know what else they sang. And then I went to Norwalk Records, I'm like, oh shit, like there's there's Lee Williams and the Symbols, that's a whole fucking CD. Like, let me see what, if, if I like that song, I'm sure there's gonna be like two or three other songs I'm gonna like. And sure enough, there was. So I would read the liner notes, and I was just really dove in to the whole like do you, do you remember let me ask you when you went with your dad did your dad kind of help you or oh, did he or did he also trip out on your selections no he do you he remember he was always helping me he okay yeah, he was t- pretty much telling me i would ask him like hey man that song dad remember this song and i would uh, sing right. it to him and he yeah. would know it and then we would ask the, the record store owner like where that would be in the record store and we would go in that section and look for that record and my dad and his friend puppy um they were my dad was uh and what you call an original record collector, and so was his friend Puppy. They collected only, they were all about collecting original label stuff because anything other than that is just fake. Like, why would you want, like, what's the point of collecting if you're going to buy knockoff shit? Like, there's no point to it. You want the original thing if you're going to collect it, right? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of been handed down to me when I go to the record store. I did see the songs on collectibles, on reissue labels, on bootleg labels like Memory Lane or collectibles or memory pain and all these other like bootleg labels i would see the song but my friend my my dad and marcos would be like nah don't buy that that's that's a that's a knockoff that's not that's not the original label it came on you want to aspire to collect the og you want to have the original because in time it's going to get it's gonna bec- it's gonna become more valuable so as well. At least you got some good game early on. Bro. I got good game early on, but I was taught like I was just taught to buy, go yeah. after the first press, and then I started learning about because there's even like a such thing as like a, a label, there's like a song that could be on like ten different labels or like five different record companies and five different labels. So as long as you got like the first or second pressing, like that was that was suffice for me. That was good enough for me if I had the first. If you couldn't find the first record, because with doo-wop, it was really 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 extra hard. To get those first pressings, man. Because you're talking about music from the 50s and late 50s and early 60s, or predominantly fif- mid 50s and late 50s. So to find an original label of a doo wop, it was almost impossible. It was really expensive. So I had to settle a lot for the second press or maybe the third press. But there was times I did get the first press. But it was instilled in my mind to like y- the ultimate goal is to try to get the first pressing and get that in, in your hard file in your you're collection. Either a, you're either a collector or a listener. If you're just listening, you're still with every piece, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. If, yeah, you yeah. if you're if you're like a, a listener and you're an yeah. enthusiast, you really yeah. like it. Like it doesn't matter because you still get the vibe of the music. You get but the music. But collecting is a whole. It's yeah, a whole other thing. Yeah, but if you're gonna wear that badge on your on yeah. your shirt mm-hmm. that you're a collector, yep. now now you gotta kind of like um, uphold the dignity of that craft, yeah. you know, and and, and and go after the original pressings because that's the whole point of being a, a collector is to have so original. so by the time you know that i met you um how many years already were you like into and and how uh, do you can you approximate how many albums you had because i know at one point you had a shitload and we'll get into that too i know you know something happened along the line which is fucked up but um yeah about that time I mean, how f- how deep were you into the? Because I know you had a bunch of rare shit. We used to listen to shit and be like, "Fuck, this is hot." We would listen. Oh yeah. We would be in the studio. I would take my records yeah. to, to Blunt Studio yeah, and, and literally like a bunch of rappers are there, a bunch yeah. of people who 
Like, there was, like, 20, 15 people in his studio that. sometimes. We're all drinking fucking uh, Remy Martin. That's all that fool drank. Oh, yeah. Was the Remy. Sip on the yak. The sure. Sipping on yak and fucking just getting stoned, get just fucking smoking yak. At this time, you were known as Oldie George. That's how I remember. Oh, yeah. See, I didn't even George. know that. I, I, didn't even, I, I didn't remember I told you, I used to even have him in my phone as Oldie George. That's what they call him. I did not even know that. I, what's funny is about that name you're saying, uh, back when I was 16, 17 years old in, in my neighborhood of Montebello where I grew up, all my friends. All my friends, because I had such a vast, no I acquired such a vast knowledge for like the underground or B-side oldies and just oldies in general. When I was 17, all my homies called me the young veterano. You, oh. have, you can laugh if you want. <laughs> that's they used to call me the young vete. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good thing. Because though. I was like Funny 17, that. but I had like the the mentality, uh, yeah. uh, the the musical library. Like I was, I was schooling veteranos, bro. Like straight up. Like For I swear to God. Forward thinking and 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 uh. And I took pride in that, man. How, 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 how many albums do you think you had at that point? By Doug? 2005, um, okay, this is like from 95 to 2005, because 96 is when I actually first dropped my, um, I started making mixtapes, okay. In 95, 96, I was making a few mixtapes. Like my dad took out, follow my dad's footsteps. That's what, it, yes, because I remember you already had some under, y under your belt by the time you right. came there. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm trying to get to, so yeah. I don't want to miss a beat here. In like the 90s, five, mid 90s, 95, I started doing my own, do wop tapes, but more so I started gravitating towards now soul music because mm -hmm. uh, the doo wop was cool and the doo wop was just oversaturated. So I had to find a new angle on like a and this new soul. There were some soul comps that came out that literally blew my mind. It introduced me to a whole new style of soul music. I mean, I'm talking deeper than the Delphonics, deeper than Bloodstone, deeper than Harold Malvern and the Blue Notes B side soul that I was familiar with. I'm talking like a whole different level of soul music, man. And there is this CD called Soulful Things. And there is this another CD followed after that called like Toker's Oldie. I, rem I remember because we spoke about this on bar sessions, which we're going to get into in a bit. But those are major inspirations. For oh, you, yeah, so man. Yeah. So I, I remember hearing like uh, Soulful Things and, and hearing like uh, Remember the Rain by 21st Century and, 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 and the topics, All Good Things Must End and. I never heard anything like that style of soul group harmony. It was so refreshing to hear. And I I remember like really asking my dad and his homie, like, what is this? And my, so my dad's homie didn't even know some of the jams. And that's when I knew it was special. Like, damn, like Marcos don't even know what the fuck this is. Like, whoa. You know, but he had a feeling. He was naming groups. He, he was hip because he, he was hip to do up. And he was hip to soul music. Don't get me wrong. Like they were pretty knowledgeable in soul music as well. They were hip to the whatnots and all these other soul groups that were like sounding just as good as the groups I've mentioned. But yeah, so these CDs basically lit a fire under my ass. And I gravitated towards that sound of music and I really started going in. That's when I told you earlier I was like really going to Noak Records and going to Sounds of Music and going to these record stores. These are CD OG shops. spots, by the way. Yeah. If anybody that was, ar you know, been in the, you know, around at that time, you know what these. And places. they're still around. They're oh yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. still they're still around. They're still. And shout and shout, shout out, out to shout yeah. out to them for just, um, you know, because you know as well, it's not always the most lucrative thing to just be so into music. You have to figure out ways to make it um lucrative but a lot of it is uh, you know a good percentage of the people even ourselves with this platform um it's just our heart is so into it it's not right and it shows yeah, uh, obviously we it's need authentic obviously at some point we we need some income from it but right but the thing is 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 it's the hearts in it dog some of us just love music that much and dog i commend you on that for real so yeah so okay. exactly so uh, uh, ear for everything bro i had i had the the heart for it, man, yeah. definitely, and, and and soulful things and tokers, and a few other comps were definitely the ones because I would go to the store, I would go to the shops, right, and I would ask like Mondo or or, or Chief, you know, at Sounds of Music, hey man, what's all you had to do was say what's new, and they would bust. It. This is when CDs started becoming the new normal, because because tapes, because there was a tape called Secret Sounds, mm -hmm. and that shit was also around the same era, but like. And there was some crazy shit on Secret Sounds, like underground oldie-wise. So that's what opened the door. That's what kicked the door open for me. Mm -hmm. And then when the CD started coming out, when when the when the public was finally able to make their own mixtape on a CD, right. I remember. So I'm gonna get into that. So now I'm about a year in. Now it's like 1996, 95, 96. 
I'm a year in of just going head first buying crazy soul records now. I I I, I'm, I used to buy doo wop records from this guy named uh you know heavy set Ruben. Uh, uh, he has a little brother named Benny. They were collectors, and Ruben would come to my house all the time. Was his name Heavy Set Ruben? I could have been. That's an epic name, right there. <laughs> you know, it sounded like a rapper, Heavy yeah. Set Ruben. All right, go ahead. Go so, uh, so his name's uh, uh, Ruben, and he would literally come to my pad with like boxes and boxes of doo wop records, and I would tell him like, "Hey, man, I would let him hear some of the some of the soul music I had." He goes, "Oh, that's that's like that 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 group soul harmony." I got some of that. I'm like, you do? Oh he goes, shit. yeah. He goes, I got some of that. And then he recommended me a store to go to. So I, I used to go to the store, but I just never. But at the time, he probably thought you were just straight doo wop, like yeah. on the doo wop. Yeah, he thought shit. I was straight doo wop because yeah, yeah. I was his doo wop customer. Yeah. So yeah. I started asking him for soul, you know, soul music. Like yeah. I just called it soul. This was before it was even pinned sweet soul, because now that's what it's called today. Yeah. Like, predominantly, it's called sweet soul, rare soul. But back then, it was just called like group soul. Or like group soul harmony, you know, it, and see, like I'm not as versed in, in that. I mean, I know, you know, I love oldies, obviously, but not as educated as far as the artists and the diff the times and all that stuff. But um, I think by the time we were in the studio, I think you are, it was already rare soul. But yeah, it, yeah. But it was before sweet soul came because I don't remember hearing sweet soul. No, sweet soul was a term. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Sweet, sweet soul, like ninety five. Okay. Sweet soul. I think even sweet soul got the term even in the early nineties, but okay. it didn't. It wasn't the everyday word for it. Because you know? by the time you can, because I remember even some of your comps, which we're going to get into. They said sweet soul on it. Oh, I remember even, the, um, but when we were get in there, it was like we got rare soul. I remember right. we would always say rare soul samples, dog. Right, cause right, rare soul. Because there was a difference. Yes, yes, yes. Because there was a difference between like sampling a top 40 hit from oh, the OJs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have a rare soul sample. It's just under basically saying it's underground, you know. But, anyways, yeah, mid 90s. Um, I'm I'm reading the Discoveries magazine, and um, I see an ad in the paper, and it says transform your tapes to CD, and I was like, holy shit! Like that's what I that's like the it was open to the public, so I called the number, and dude, craziest shit of all because Discoveries magazine is like a record collector magazine, and it's like a nationwide thing, and it's got it's got sellers from like California to New York and everything in between. It just so happened that that particular ad, it was like if it was like destiny, bro. I always, I always think about why, how it worked out so easily. And for some me. things are, brother. Yeah, some man. Things are. So I called that number, and they were they were based in Covina. Like, what were <laughs> the fucking odds yep. of that? They were based in Covina. They were called uh um, uh, what's the name of the shop, man? I'm losing, I'm losing it here. Um, Marijuana, marijuana. Hey, fixed hey, to Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, and and he don't even smoke. Yeah. Oh, they were called V Corp, V Corporation. It was called V Corp. They were over on Edna Place. I think they're still there to this day. Oh wow. Uh, yeah. So there's the ad for V Corporation, and I called them, man. And I'm here. I am th at this time. I already, you know, I'm like 23 years old or 22 years old. I'm, I already have my own family. I have kids. And um, 2000. That's when I met you, Rabbit. 2005. So we jumped about 10 years ahead of, of the game. I'm glad you remember the year, bro, because I, maybe I smoke <laughs> too much <laughs> weed. Right I, can't, yeah, yeah. I just go, yeah, I've known him for over 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I go by that. <laughs> so in, in 2005 when I met you and I was at Blunt Shop, yeah. um, I was reading the ad of the paper, and, and um, I learned that there was a way to get my mixtape onto CD. And um, let me go back 10 years to 95. I'm fucking up here. So, yeah. So, this was like 95. So, now I have this. I I get a mask. I record all these records that I bought. Mary Wells, Eddie Holman. These are all dope-ass songs. But I didn't really see them on these. There was only a so many CDs at the time when I was doing this. Like I said, there was a handful. There were Soulful Things, Tokers. And there was even these ones called Taste of Chicago that were, that were kind of new at the time coming in. But that was from Chicago. They were like imported to like the alley didn't really carry it. It, it, it. it wasn't really like something on the shelf at all times. So it was predominantly really just soulful things and Toker's oldies were like the go to comps. Uh, yeah, you had your other ones like Homeboy's Favorite Soul and all these other little knockoff CDs that, that were making noise. But I did a CD and I came up with the name The Lost and Found. It just had a ring to it. 
like I said. So I did my first CD compilation. I took all these records, recorded them at the studio. This guy's studio in Baldwin Park, some Asian guy. I don't even remember. Oh, even it, was it Mike Lynn? Mike Lynn? It could have been Mike Lynn. Was he had it PNL? PNL, that's yeah. it. PNL. Dude, what hey, the fuck? what's crazy <laughs> you said that is that's one of the recording studios we no used way. to use. Shout what the to, fuck? Shout out to the homies. Yeah, dude, they're this age. I just, like, I forgot how I Chino got Chino Mike, man. I forgot how I got a hold of them. I think yeah. I looked them in the penny saver. Or hey, bro, nah, something. <laughs> no, well. I, no, because I, I, I used to drive by there. I found oh, it because of that, but I went in and chopped it up with them, right? Yeah. It, then, so we used to do, we actually recorded one of our whole CDs there. That's fucking crazy. Because because we got into it so good, Drac became one of his engineers, dog. Hey, dog. But that's funny you said that. That's crazy. That's nuts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some dude in Baldwin Park. Yeah. Right there on Ramona. Ramona, yeah. yeah. It was an Asian guy. Yeah. And he's the one who had the, the capabilities to record my vinyl onto like a tape uh, this like dope ass tape and then from that tape i took it to v corp and then they they did it to to cd i think camel toe was recorded there yeah <laughs> Fuck. Uh, dude. yeah That's how OG i don't even know the dude's name i just remember he was an asian guy he was yeah. probably about five or ten years older than me at yeah. the time about my a little bit he was kind of young yeah that was yeah. him man that's no, like i haven't P- seen that dude in years right when you said p and l he was a, a thi- like he made me look buff he was <laughs> he was a thin guy. I know who you're talking about yeah, yeah. Bro, like but literally <laughs> no literally Didn't he wear glasses? We right? used to have uh, sometimes. He yeah. he didn't wear them all the time. But yeah, we literally like we took his spot over for a while. They ended up buying him out because this uh this company expanded and uh-huh. I th- and I think he moved it to his house, but I haven't seen that guy in years. But that's um w- it's funny you said that because that's how we ended up coming out with actually official CDs like we had a spot where now okay, now we're Master, we're, f- yeah, we're, we're recording we're it. Recording it we're making copies and we're selling them. But that's one of the first spots. And that's bro. how I felt because I'm like, if uh, that's how I felt when I made when I met him and I had my master copies, I felt like, dude, like this is it, this is this is it. I'm I'm in I'm in like I'm in. I'm part of this now. Listen, this w- this is what we we'll do real quick because we want to go through. I, I want to go through those um, the comps that you put out. We want to go through that and then and kind of get back and then we'll we'll go forward to where we're at now. But um, real quick, I, I did want to say um, shout out to our sponsor, man, Uncle Jack's Weed, uh, and also Cam Light, man. Um, we, anybody you know that wants to be a sponsor, just hit us up, um, hit us up directly or whatever. Hit us up on the email, whatever you guys want to do. You know how by now, but either way, man, shout out to these sponsors for taking. And if you're it. interested in their products, hit us up too. The Cam Light yeah. is actually a, what do they call it? It's like this. It's a stone that somehow has the like the a salt. Ther- Salt rock, salt rock that has some therapeutic effect, and then it's got the light and everything. I like heard about that. these salt rock things. Those yeah. they, 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 if I mean, if you believe in it, which I kind of do, man, yeah. I'm open minded to a lot of shit. Same, bro. It, 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 it actually will give like good energy out. Right. That's like the whole point. Thank you. You know what it exactly. is, dog. It'll hey. give good energy. It'll fill the whole room with like. Same thing good with energy. Uncle Jack's weed. It'll give you good energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll make, it'll uh, make you feel good. No, yeah. but they got <laughs> stuff. Everything from lotions and soaps to edibles and all that Dope. stuff. But I just wanted to say real quick, thank you to them for taking a chance you know on our puck let me attend to this business real quick there it is <laughs> anyways man, thank you for coming again george i known you for a long time um the cds man um w- we're talking about how you know from you found a way to convert them then you found a way to distribute them exactly and what w- what's out there now that you have put out and they've been out for a long time yeah man um for those that don't know that are you know either collectors or listeners now um this guy's been doing his thing for a long time so he's well versed in this shit but uh go ahead and name off some of the stuff you put out man yeah man and uh, like i left off uh in 1995 borderline 96 i released my i crossed over and i i contributed to the to the soul scene or the oldie world my rare flavor of music which was called the lost and found rare oldies and that that's before uh noak records or uh thump put out the r&b's lost and found that was about a year before they even thought of the name it was like a big coincidence because i remember when uh the lost and found came out it was called the R. I think it was like huggy boy presents the lost and found or something like that but uh i was even like a year and a half before that happened you know um but anyways, yeah, I did th- I did three volumes of the Lost and actually I did four volumes of the Lost and Found in the um from ninety five till about ninety six and a half, ninety seven. I was doing 
the Lost and Found comps. Lost and Found Volume 1 just sold like crazy. Okay, like I, so now I'm going to explain. As that's happening, as I'm selling these Lost and Found Volume 1s, there's other compilations now coming out the woodworks. You know, now you got another compilation called uh, uh, City of Angels. You got another compilation called, uh, uh, there's like, like I said, um, Homeboy one. Homeboy's Favorite Soul, Taste of Chicago, Soul Vocal Group Delights. And these are from New York coming to L.A. But as far as like L.A. homegrown collectors coming out with comps. Oh, and you had, uh, I think at the same time, around the same time, even uh, Mr. Ruben Molina came out with a CD called, um, I think they were called Hood Dreams. Or, and he also did San Antonio's West Side Sound. But I think that came a lot later than Hood Dreams. But I think Hood Dreams was something mm -hmm. he put out. And it was you know this underground type soul music you know mm -hmm. but um yeah man you would see these one-off cds coming out but they didn't really follow up you know so that's how i kind of knew that they weren't really real about it because the people i looked up to they had follow-up cds like they had a volume one like what i mean by follow-up is like a volume one and then a volume two a volume three now when you start seeing a a, a, a name brand cd that's underground from LA or wherever it may be, and it has different volumes following up with it. Now you know that this whoever's doing this is kind of serious about what he's doing, and has extensive collection of music, you know, to be putting this stuff out. So, I, I did volume one, and then I did volume two. Now between volume volume one and volume two, there's a quick little story I gotta interject here where I'm, you know. I'm collecting these soul records and I'm going to like golden oldies in Inglewood and I'm buying these sweet soul. Re now we're calling them sweet soul records. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the name we kind of came up with sweet soul. It, it could, that term could have been long before um, I started calling it sweet soul, but this is just my experience of, of everything. You know, I'm like 18, 19 years old now. And you know, s we're putting out sweet soul music uh, before even it was even called Rare Soul. I think Rare Soul didn't come up around to like the late 90s, early 2000s is when we started penning it as like Rare Sweet Soul or Rare Soul for the terminology of it all, uh, geek stuff. So, um, so yeah, I did volume two. So I met, I ended up going to a party, played my tape for somebody, and, th and this person's like, hey man, that tape is fucking, like they were mind blown by it. Like, hey man, there's this other guy do is that that has the same music you have, and I was like, really? He goes, yeah, man, I gotta introduce you guys. He goes, are you sure this ain't his tape? I'm like, no, this is mine. Like, I I, <laughs> I, sh I even showed him like I did this. Like, I think I even like have, you know, I I had some proof that I did it. You know, I'm like this is my shit. Like, you know, this is the music I collect and my dad and his homies and this is kind of like the direction I went to. He goes, oh, stop scared, man. There's this dude you gotta meet, and uh, it was Robert Ramos guy named Robert Ross, some other Crazy. collector, another yeah, collector yeah. named Robert Ross, big name in, 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 yeah, this I, I in, the, in the godfathering I, of this. I've heard you telling many stories about uh, this uh, rare sweet soul culture that is now existing. Um, so I met Robert Ramos through this guy named Edmund, older guy, and we hit it off, bro. And, 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 and what was another thing that was like destiny or weird is that Robo Robert lived right in my dad's neighborhood in Pico Rivera. Which is crazy, like yeah. like from the same neighborhood as well, like in that neighborhood, like the barrio. So I was like, "What the fuck?" So we clicked off real good, and Robert, man, just had this. Ex he was like a year younger than me, so I was like nineteen or twenty. Robert was like eighteen or nineteen. This guy was doing underground oldies at the time. Now, when underground oldies hit, that was that that was like the game changer. I mean, you had all these underground guys doing their their works, like I said. Soulful things, tokers, myself with lost and found, um, you know, uh, city of angels, uh, all these like, I don't want to say, you know, all these like homegrown, authentic compilations coming from actual record collectors, uh, uh, you know, putting out their series, uh, because we all found a way to to convert it from tape to CD, and we started to build a market. We started a brand. We learned, like, hey man, this is dope. We're getting our music out there to the masses. And, you know, it's profitable, too, at the same time. But I wasn't really in it for the profit. I was in it for just the love of the music. And really, I wanted people to hear the kind of music we did. So, I mean, this is this is stuff like a lot of, you know, maybe either up and coming collectors or people that have even been doing it for a while. Um, like they I know they're interested to hear some of the stuff that like you've 
gone through and your experiences yeah in, man in this shit this is crazy bro because and then so <laughs> so how many do you have under your belt total right now as far as uh, uh musical compilations I, that I, i've got to say in somewhere in the range of, of cds that i've been involved with like putting my records on somewhere in the range of 30 comps jeez yeah so you're definitely doing your thing man yeah th- about that 30 comp 30 oldie compilation and we'll get into like the compilation names so one day just fast forward a little bit Robert has a fallout, and then he comes to me and he says, "Hey George, uh, uh, I say we should team up because we were the three, we were like amongst the three hottest selling CDs in the Los Angeles rare oldie underground. It was like Lost and Found, Underground Oldies, City of Angels. You still had Soulful Things, you had Tokers, and then at that same time there was another CD that that came from a barrio that did pretty good called To Every Story. Uh, I remember when uh, Lost Soul came out." Uh, so did to every story was out around the same time. But before I get to the Lost Soul story, this is what it was. Lost and Found, City of Angels, Underground Oldies. Robert um, was the main guy doing Underground Oldies. So he had a fallout with ITP. And he gets with me. And he's like, hey, George, because my CD's selling great. Sal Rodriguez's CDs are selling great. And, you know, he has the knowledge. He goes, let's start a record label. I want to get you. And I want to get Sal. And let's all three team up and let's start this one legit record label. Because Robert acquired the knowledge of like licensing music, you know, doing everything by the book the right way. Like, like um, you know, like really putting together a legit record label, not some like bootlegger type stuff. We wanted he wanted to elevate the game with the underground collectors, which he did. So we united. And, wha- and what was it called? It was called uh, We Came. I remember going to his house in Pico and. I, this is a true story, man. This is some story. This is stuff no one really knows about. I never, I never been interviewed. I never been asked these questions. So here it is for the record, man. Um, he really liked my lost and found name. He really liked it. Like, yo, man, that CD you got lost and found. I like the name and I like what you got going with the cover. Remember, my friend Danny that was doing all the house party flyers, he was a graphic designer. So he was the guy design. I, I was sitting in with Danny. And we spent hours putting together these dope covers uh, on Photoshop at the time, which was very in its beginning stages, you know, of, of doing graphic design. So I had these really catchy looking covers with the alley background, a bomba on the front, like some some like cholita, some chola girl face in the clouds, but like kind of see through. And it, it, it was just like really put together well. Cholas are cool, though. Yeah, or, 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 or <laughs> my volume one. Can't go wrong with that. The, the volume one of Lost and Found. It's like a, it's like a zoot suit guy, yeah. and we cropped that out, and we put it like, like transparent, like you could kind of see through it, which was like groundbreaking at the time for Photoshop to do those kind of things. Um, as far as the cover goes, you didn't see that those kind of so, covers. So you guys all like collabed on that at one. So we collabed. So s- Robert gets to me, the mastermind. He's like, "Yo, bro." I'm going to start this record label, but we need to come up with a name and we need some money. And uh, once you you want to be involved, I said, well, hell yeah. yeah. So he's like, if you want to be involved, then you got to stop. Stop stop what you're doing. I have to tell Sal he has to stop. And we got to focus on what we're, good, we're, we're about to do. And um, I, I, on the record right now, I'm telling you guys, um, and if we ever find, if we ever get a hold of Robert one day to interview him, you know, he's kind of off the radar right now. But if we ever interview Robert Ramos, um, he could probably vouch on this and say that he really liked the name of Lost and Found. And uh, and we were throwing around names off of that because he wanted it to sound similar to Lost and Found. So we're like something this and this. And, that. and then he said it. I'm not sure if it was me or if it was him. I can't remember. But someone said Lost Soul. And we were like, yeah, Lost Soul. And he's like, we're like, Lost that, Soul. That's what, like, see, that's what I remember. That's what it was called. I remember when so you had brought some product over when we were in the studios. Right. Some Lost Soul shit. Right. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. I, and when I brought that to you guys in 2005, Lost Soul was already legendary yeah, by that time. That, that was, was crazy. It was like 10 years, about nine years in its making. But in 1996, me and Robert uh, got together. I was at his house in Pico, and we came up with the name Lost Soul. And then... Then the second question was, well, what are we call, what are we gonna call the label? And he was like, Lost Soul Records. I'm yeah, like, yeah. It just like it was like that. That's what I remember. It was like that, bro. Instantly, like yeah. it just happened, like boom. So Lost Soul Oldies, and then Lost Soul Records was born. I gave him my feria, like literally the next day. We all contributed thirty five hundred bucks. I wish I had the receipt that he gave me. It was like a handwritten receipt. 
I think for me moving over the years, I've lost it somewhere, but it literally says on the receipt, George Miller, I, George Miller Jr., I'm giving $3,500 to Robert Ramos for the contribution of, you know, co-producer of Lost Soul Records, and then I signed it, and then he signed it. I, I don't have that no more. I wish I did. That would be a good, uh, you Proof, know, some like, no yeah. nostalgia right some there. Some nostalgia, man. Hey, 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 so, you know, 30 projects or so under your wing, man. Um, the thing is, like, again, it's not – obviously, we, we have to uh, make a living at some point and all that. Right. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, the, your heart's really in this, man. And, and even till today, like, you, you've got even – you're dropping more projects – You've collabed with other people. Like we have some of those projects. We have still in the garage. We bump. It's you know all about. I mean? Like, but you've been collabing along the way, and you you continue to work and network with people. Exactly, and that's, that's man. Something. Hey, speaking but of that, real quick, I wanted to ask you because you were talking about about thirty projects under your belt. Do you have an uh, actual copy of all of them? No, nope. they're all got, they're, they're all scratched up. I never really. I used to really think about like keeping them, but yeah. I didn't. As you're doing it, like you don't. I never really thought about like, yeah. oh, these are gonna be collectible like one, one day. day, one day yeah, one no, day. it was just like a thing, and it really took 15 years to really evolve to where it's at. And it happened, it happened overnight, man. When the, when the boom happened, when the oldie boom happened, is when really social media boomed. So like oh, when yeah. when Facebook happened, like in 2010, I want to say, I want to say in 2010, yeah, my even my even the MySpace days, the collectors were communicating with each other but it, it didn't have that impact that that it has in the on the public right now like it didn't it didn't really reach the impact i and you know what i i have an idea of why the fucking um the boom happened you know i'm gonna fast forward here a little bit you know i'm not gonna fast forward i gotta i gotta keep it on the timeline so um so you know i was involved with lost soul records you know i didn't put out those compilations it was those compilations were robert and sal that that made all they have 15 compilations, and then they have two compilations of uh, Lost Ladies of Soul, two compilations of Lost Chicano Oldies, one compilation of Lost Group Doo-Wop, or Lost Group Harmony, it's called. And that's because we all talked about it, because I have a really strong doo-wop background, if you remember me saying so. Oh, yeah. Well, that I mean, we've talked about that before as, as we've s collabed on interviews and stuff, but... That was kind of like your go-to genre at the beginning, and then it kind of... Right. So we wanted it. Yeah. So this was like the year 2000, and it was like, you know, five years after my doo-wop days, and I told Robert, hey, man, let's do like, let's do something for... There's no doo-wop CDs out there. Let's do a dope-ass, like, rare underground doo-wop. So Lost Soul did a doo-wop CD called Lost Group Harmony, and that was... That, that, that brainchild came from me, but we all agreed to do it. We all, we all collaborated on it. I'm not going to say it was me. It was Robert and Sal had doo wop too, so did I, and we we put that out there probably because I brought it up. Really, let's do a doo wop CD. So that's how that got formed, and then I they gave me my own production uh, thing called Heart and Soul because Robert and Sal in the in the Lost Soul Records camp, they were gonna take care of the really really obscure underground soul music. That was their job to put that out. My job was to like hit the other target audience. To kind of hook them in, so later on they would get. They would get into the Lost Soul oldies, so they let me do a CD called Heart and Soul. Now Heart and Soul was like the bridge; it was like not really rare stuff, but it was rare stuff. It wasn't quite the Lost Soul stuff they were putting out, but it was like it was the the gap. It was the bridge to bring them over to the Lost Soul comp. So there was like a, a good uh, plan that Robert had with that. So I had big name groups like the Whispers. Um, you know, Donnie Albert, like really like names people could that the general population at the time could really remember like, oh, I, yeah, Donnie Albert. Oh, oh, the whispers are on here. Oh, man. Um, we sprinkled in a few rares, but predominantly we put in the big names, but the B side stuff. And that's what Heart and Soul was for. But it was a very well put together compilation series. There was two volumes. Hey, so, so what he's basically saying is, there's a lot of product out there. This dude's been doing his shit for a while. Yeah, like man. Like I'm, just real, real I'm sorry. I hate to drag it on, but I, I feel I really have to like really break it down of how it how it really went because no one really interviewed me. 
no one really got the uh this is like some stuff to geek if you're a record collector listening to this or someone who appreciates the rare soul culture well you, you're gonna be geeking out well, on some of the well stuff that's kind of where i was going is there there's another thing i feel like um maybe you know maybe a couple people did it or whatever but even with um like w- with the with the I, I don't know if you want to call it a podcast we had a, it was like a party on li- online um e- even going forward though to the bar sessions and even your soul 101 um, yeah. it's like um you innovated you know what i mean and right. you, you give people kind of the backstories they want to hear on the music they love right and i think you kind of were innovative on that side and, and even uh throwing the show and we'll, and we'll talk about them the soul 101 is more of an you know an in-depth like we're doing here but then the the bar sessions was really some it was like literally we had a party here yeah it, yeah it was really cool yeah, so, so we're gonna fast forward out of the 90s of the 2000s you know because you know it, we have a time frame to kind of like well you know, you know what here. yeah because we could have oh you know what this w- w- we could have a week-long podcast with george yeah <laughs> you know how many stories like no there's seriously a lot of stories and that what we, what we can do i, I really do want to do this. yeah no i really want to do this and we'll have it like a you know where you contribute to the you know what i mean right, right, right. you got so much knowledge on music and that's that's really dope bro and but that's what i kind of wanted to go to is you kind of mentioned when the social media kind of took effect that it, it became even more popular obviously more accessible people right. even the common fan a listener but then collectors could even like get their own knowledge and not just from doing their research but then you created a show where you can actually <coughs> like you're teaching something while you're doing it it's pretty dope right and people would do that when they would post their records yeah you know people would post like a record they got in the mail and show it off kind of like a trophy back in the the facebook days i I used to be, i'm guilty of it we would start youtube you know we were uploading our records onto youtube yeah. and um you know people were buying these compilations um so these compilations that were made in the 90s man they really set the tone for what the mid 2000s were you know because that was the new sound and that was the new sound because of all these new compilations not just what i did but there's many other people who contributed to compilations had their own style and inspired people. and inspired people yeah to do other things so now that was becoming the new norm people wanted to hear that no one wanted to hear no disrespect to art lebeau or the common top 40 hits but no one really wanted to hear that no more people were intrigued by this new sweet soul group harmony sound that was just mind-blowing and that's because of the internet you know like as collectors um we were able to see before the internet you would li- you would just go to your record local store and dig and f- and buy whatever 45s they had uh, peop- you know record stores in Los Angeles weren't really buying 45 you weren't really getting distribution from other record stores let's say like from Ohio or Detroit yeah, yeah. or New York or Philly the al- unless it was like a top 40 thing then the LA store would carry it but you're not going to get that 100 only made that this Ohio group sang that's going to be in Ohio you know you so the guys in L.A. would never didn't learn that music until the Internet hit. And when the Internet hit, when eBay hit, when uh, the catalogs hit, you, you know, the, the the record exchanging magazines, that was the before the Internet. That was the only way you were really going to take a chance on a record. Because I remember being in, ni- in the mid 90s looking on discoveries or, di- or um, gold mine record collecting magazines. I was looking at record stores in Texas and I was just like, you wouldn't hear a sound clip. You would just see a name. It's if it sounded cool, like the techniques for how can you win on, you know, on this label, five bucks. Like, OK, I'm going to buy that. I would, I would I would call them and I would place my order, send a money order. And like a week later, a, a box of record 45 would come in the mail and I never heard them. I would put them on boat and like it was a 50 50 shot. Some, oh of, the yeah, song, some of the songs yeah. were good. Some of the songs were just trash some of the songs blew your mind and then i've also from doing that i've I've learned to meet record collectors from other states like guys from new york guys from philly guys from ohio that i would personally call and they were showing me stuff and that's how this rare music came to la is, hey. is by that and then it more so you know so that, that's the 90s then when the internet hit it just more so happened. Now, now you're able to go on eBay, and these guys in Ohio are putting up this record, and now you hear a sound clip with it, and I, damn. I always thought, like, even, you know, just the, the the mesh, I guess you could say, with our, you know, mainly hip-hop platform here, 
um and then when we when we put together that show it was so uh it was organic and then you even built a bar oh yeah like the homies like some of the homies that are gonna watch this or listen to this um they they remember some of them were here but we had some epic shit here dog like yeah man. i remember sick jack came to play some of his shit man psycho right. rum uh, uh dog we had you had bands in here like bands live ba- bands? a full band was playing in this dude and those bands now are like touring the world bro yeah. those bands now are do like they're doing it doing it shout out to jason joshua and the oh Beholders. yeah dog no. they killed it uh, jason joshua Shit. man hey, so uh, what was the those was yesterdays Panrose oh, family gay broth dap oh, tone yeah. Oh, yeah. bro like those guys speaking of which i'm doing projects right now and that's currently that's what i'm doing right now man i'm making music with dap tone producers uh, gay bra song. i'm coming out with my own music right now no one yeah. even knows that and, and you've been in the studios man this guy like uh people that don't know man george is well versed in the studios too besides his music knowledge so it ain't nothing to go and produce yeah no, no one tracks, re- yeah man. no one really knows like let's touch on that real quick like when we met in 2005 when i was bringing these oldies because by 2005 i had a vast collection of these rare underground oldies man i had one of the baddest collections of the time with any of the top collectors of that era of that time and i, w- I had i was young enough to still love hip-hop and my friends were listening to Ch- always listen to chicano rap you know and whatever and uh, chicano rap always like would sample oldies like i'm oh your yeah. puppet or mm-hmm. little rob sampling this or somebody sampling that mm-hmm. but I, no one was ever really sampling early in the 2000s i didn't hear no one really sampling the stuff that we put uh, on lost soul type uh, oldies yeah. like the stuff that are underground old is that kind of soul wasn't being sampled by hip hop guys. So I made it my business. I remember telling myself when I started my record label in 2005, um, I started record. Li- well, let's fast forward now. So you all heard that I, I was a part of the lost soul records. I wasn't doing the lost soul, but I was a part of it. The distribution, uh, so many angles of the lost soul records family. I was a part of that. Uh, I did in about 2002 or 2003 lost soul records ended up, um, no longer being and i took like a two-year hiatus i went back to work i was miserable i wasn't making cds i wasn't doing really nothing i i I take that back i did do a cd in between time but like it wasn't like the the old lost soul days you know i just felt lost you know so but i learned a lot from being with the lost soul records family for like the five years or four years that we did it four or five years that i was involved with them um and i was collecting along the way i kept pushing the envelope with buying rare oldies and buying seeking out these underground 45s by means of like ebay now and the internet and now we're getting more exposure to these other sides of soul music that the record collector weren't getting exposed to in the 90s so now we're on another level of music and uh i created i said you know what i'm gonna start my own label so me and my brother and our primo what we consider my cousin not blood cousin but we consider my cousin nick Nick, uh, Nick Rodriguez. We started. I said, you know what? I'll, I have I have so much records. I think I think I could put out because I was seeing people were still putting out oldie CDs. Like this CD came out to every story was coming out. Soul Things came back with like his volume two after a ten year hiatus. He dropped the volume two, and then like I'm like, oh shit! Like there's more more oldies are coming out, and I had a stockpile of oldies that no one that weren't even on CD yet. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start my own shit. And that's when I s- got with my brother and my cousin because we had money. And we started um, legitly. Like, I literally went to, like, the city hall and, like, started my record label for real and my tax ID and all that. Uh, I learned from the best, man. I learned from Robert and, S- and Sal about how to do that. I, I was in Low Rider Magazine. Uh, I was in Slow and Low Magazine uh, advertising, bro. Like, I was, like, one of the – I was, like – full on like doing this so hey, i started a record company called see, sons of soul records see that's the thing though that along the way like we, we all you know go through different journeys but it's all it's up to you to pick up pieces and actually hear some knowledge from somebody else right and like absorb that shit and it and it helps you in going forward bro because that's the shit that like like why you're you know you're you're fucking doing it right now with the i've, st- I've kept going bro yeah like, dog. i think that's a difference what sets me apart from a lot of the people is like I'm still here from 1996, never left. Mm-hmm. Not only am I still here, I'm gonna blow my own, my own horn here. I kept evolving with the scene, innovating for the scene, 
creating new ideas and new angles like clothing like there was never and that that's like i was saying like giving them a a a platform they can see where they can absorb music talk to the people that were around or help create it yeah with bar or 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 watch a whole band play that you might not have heard before but then yes and then to to venture into the let's talk about it though because the the clothing bro oh shit man i got this sick jacket on right now man yeah it is I got. I had to get me a windbreaker, bro. But um, but you got the, them, man, bro. You got the, the the company with the clothing again, innovating, um, and from your vast knowledge, it's only right that someone needs to kind of keep continuing moving the bar up, and right. and then other people could see and kind of move move with it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and people and, and there are collectors now, who are very very heavily involved with branding their own mark, doing their own thing. Hey. Can could we see some of yeah, the man. stuff? Uh, this is some Besides of the stuff. his hat, his sweater, my jacket, you know what I mean? Look at so this shit. This bro. is uh this is my this is an album right now. This is a this is the this is like um this is what I started in two thousand five, this record label called Sons of Soul Records, and I decided to call my C D compilation series Gangster Soul Harmony because that was pretty much the target audience. That was who we were. Like it was all the, all my homeboys and all the gangster fools. Who really gravitated towards these rolas, these oldies, these rare underground sweet soul songs that that you know that are here now on these various different compilations. I'm not the only compilation. I'm just telling my story and my giving you guys my experience. So I did the CD called Gangster Soul Harmony, Volume One, and you know over the course of ten years, uh, up until 2015, when I had my 10 year anniversary, I was at 10 volumes, and four girl compilation series and then um literally this year i haven't made a cd in five years man 2015 was like the last time i've ever compiled anything you know i kind of like just uh went in different directions with the soul scene you know uh if i could go back in 2009 2010 um i was one of the co-founding members of a group of record collectors called the southern soul spinners so that kind of like that. that created a whole a whole thing for the whole record collective scene in itself. And then have a following it, just people that just want to go dance and have a good time, bro. They go yeah. to your guys' events, they're guaranteed to get. Right, man. So back in 2010, fun, that that was the only group of record collectors. We were like a group of collectors. There was four or five record collectors, some of the best in Southern California with the heaviest collections or some of the people who built the best following or the best, the biggest brands or mm-hmm. we all united and, um, Part of the reason why we united was to get people together to hear these underground oldies from the people who were uh, creating the scene as the scene was happening. Because at that point in 2010, I already was, I was already five years deep with doing my Gangster Soul Harmony. I was already like up to volume five or six at that time when I became a Southern Soul Spinner. So I had a crazy collection and all my records were like known because people were buying my CD compilations. So when we were playing our rare underground oldies at these functions, people knew half of the songs already because of the compilations that were already being hey, fu- listened to. You've been, like we mentioned, dog, forward thinking and shit, and like not only just to put the music out so that people can, can hear it, putting events together because you've done events where, where people can go out and listen right. to the music. Um, but now with the with the brands, like you're – you're you have companies now like you have a, a couple of different brands bro and yeah, i really did it you man. go companies. ahead and go ahead go ahead and speak about it man because i know like the gear we're wearing uh i want to check we want to show them some of the uh the oh. covers um because i thought something that was really dope too is is these um wh- are these available everything's on the soul supply company right er, yeah okay so fast forward now to 2020 um you know some, the scene is huge it's growing it's become pop culture now, bro. Like it's pop culture, like collecting records, soul music, oldies. It's always been a culture, but it now it's like it really broke through to like the pop culture, man. So vinyl's back with the vengeance. This is my compilation used to be on CD. I just released it. I'm releasing all my compilations that were once CDs from the early 2000s. I'm now re-releasing them on vinyl nice. LP. Nice. So this is available physically. You see it. I'm holding it in my hands. This is the girl series. And these are all family photos, man. This ain't just something I 
created from cool pictures on the internet. This is all my family. Stock photos. Yeah, people really don't understand the story on that. And like I said, man, we probably got to do a whole week if you want to get into super detail. No, but detail. That, I'm thinking that's what we would do something where we can like kind of yeah, if you want to maybe get talk about a specific. We'll, we'll talk about genres. We could do different yeah, stuff like I that, bro. People like to know all the little details, of like why, how, what made you do that, like yeah. But you know, we're almost running out of time here. Yeah. I can't really elaborate on all the details. And, yeah. and listen, this is one of the other like this was another uh, again uh, forward thinking person, dog and collabing with different people that are doing their own thing as far as art but this this was a dope collab um for those that i know these i think they sold you sold out right away yeah right? I s we, that uh, thing sold out in a week man uh on instagram miss spider face till uh correct amber. amber yeah um but man like she's got her own like artwork going and then you found a way to kind of collab and well yeah man her but this again forward thinking forward i just want to talk about exactly that, yeah like, forward thinking there's plenty of other artists i this do this shit work is with. hard dog this oh yeah like so fucking sick. there's another art there's another art named beast another guy named beast um my, i have brain fog i can't remember his real name right now but we just call him beast yeah. and that's another collab sleeve right there that blue one that beast drew up for noriega records that's nice. another collab sleeve but yeah these these jackets that rabbit's holding if you guys could see him i'm not sure if you guys can see him these are custom made 45 rpm jackets um they're really thick they're for record like really people who really have a really good solid record collection or or just admire their record and, and then they they want to take pride in what jacket yeah. they put over yeah. it you know yeah so mean? now for instagram now, post look what i got with this yeah so instagram now you got post. before these jackets used to only be white or brown yeah. there was no so i had to think out the box and reinvent the wheel yes. on something that's as common as this so i'm like you know what again this is me, a product of me and Danny, Mar me, me and Danny of Liquid. Man, Image. it's even got the 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 name inside and everything. And real quick, uh, let people know where they can get at all this stuff and and um, like what's the easiest way to get at the music and the merch, bro? Because we we have to let them know before the before the end. Yeah, of the man. Show. Um, on Instagram, I go by the Vinyl Life with one L, so that's T H E V I V I N Y L I F E, and then there's an underscore, but I've I think by the time you write the vinyl, like I think I should pop up. It'll say my name, George Miller Jr. underneath it. I also have on Instagram Gangster Soul Harmony, which pretty much uh, it's the Instagram. It's the official Instagram page for this compilation series. Uh, whenever I drop something new or something Gangster Soul Harmony related, um, it's that. And then I have uh, the Soul Supply Company, yeah. which is which is like the branding and the clothing aspect uh, of what I'm doing today right now. And and it's just it's, it's real it's, it's, er it's everything put together. But actually. it's fly ass gear too. Besides just you know, um, thank you about yeah. the soul. But like that's why I got this jacket on and shit, D dog. It's a, it's a dope gear, bro. It's yeah, I'm wearing I'm wearing my uh, vinyl life soul supply company gear. Uh, and for well, those, uh, do you have a direct? Uh, just before that, do you have a direct link where they can oh, get yeah. everything? So like so when you go on my Instagram handles. The link in the bio takes you straight to my um, my website. I used to have my own dot com, my gangstersoulharmony.com would would have been, but right now I don't have it. I'm waiting for it to come back. Right now I'm on Big Cartel, so um, okay. you would have to type in Big Cartel dot gangstersoulharmony.com. So that's the website to get the merch or to check out what I have. Just to you know, give it a look over of what I have. I have all kinds of different gear, albums, forty fives. Like those bands like Jason Joshua, uh, the Los Yesterdays, they're on a label called Penrose and Mongo Hill, and they're releasing 45. So I'm buying their stuff, wholesale distribution, and I'm selling it now on my on my you know Instagram. Uh, and my you know I'm I'm pushing that whole movement of modern soul and, uh, and live music. Hey dog, it's fucking dope, dog, and it's it like knowing each other for a long time. Like, you know, we're always trying to, you know. Flip the script, change the envelope yeah, man, you a little gotta, you, bit. Like, you gotta, you think gotta, outside. And you gotta have a really yeah. um, and a lot of things. Creative even, mind. Even like some of the stuff um, that we're still doing as far as our platform, like people have took it and ran with it, and then they, of course, like they're not gonna say they got it from, they seen it from here or whatever. Right. But, but but you know what? 
Uh, we all know. Yeah, yes. And the thing is, like, we have to keep it moving anyways. We got yeah, other, no matter what. We got other ideas. We got more things to do. So if somebody copies us, like, oh, I got more. Don't worry. You got, yeah, mo- yeah. You got yeah. more to copy. Don't exactly. worry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, you're doing, what, <laughs> you're doing what I did. Don't trip. I yeah. got plenty more Don't coming trip. out. Don't hey, hey, speak, trip. <laughs> hey, speaking of that real quick, I just wanted to go back to bar sessions real quick. Yeah, uh, we didn't really touch on yeah, bar yeah, sessions. I, I just Bring had a couple of questions regarding it. But uh, first of all, I wanted to, like, start out by saying, like, I mean, I, I, I produced the show. Right. But, um, like the thing was th- with the music that was being played and stuff, like there's no way to not vibe out. And, oh yeah, know, bar produ- sessions was yeah, magical, and I, bro. And I'm producing the show, and uh, you know, I, I'm even vibing <coughs> out with this girl, you know, during the show. And two years later, she's now my girlfriend. So you know, right. thanks. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we were vibing out. I mean, that was kind of when I first, you know, started. Yeah. See what see what it did. You know, but but uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to ask you about that was what was the inspiration from um going from because I know you were doing it on your life at your own home or whatever. From from deciding to do it here, and the other thing, uh, going to both questions, wh- whenever you ask, uh-huh. w- which one was your favorite episode? Oh, okay, that's that's a, that's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> um, the bar sessions idea started. I bought a house in Moreno Valley, and I had I bought the pad, and it had a wet bar in the house. Okay. And I was working, and I was remember I took a two week vacation. It was around Christmas time, and this was when social media was cracking. This was on Instagram. This was 2017. I think I said that right. Mm-hmm. So you could go live on Instagram and all that, and that's catching on. So one day, I, I have my record player on the bar, and I used to I used to have my bar all set up, alcohol, all that, and I would have my portable turntable there and my whole little setup because I would play, I would drink, and I would play my music at the bar. Wait, and I would did have you say drink? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I just had to crack one more. Hell yeah! Oh. So uh, if you guys follow me on Instagram, man, oh. my old school followers, you remember I used to do bar sessions at my house. Uh, I created the name Bar Sessions because it was like a, it was like a session, it was like a teaching session. Because I would literally get drunk at my bar, and I'm playing records. I'm going live like at one in the morning. No one's really on. I'm on vacation, and I was just like spilling my beans, bro. Because I really have nowhere to vent. Sometimes I keep <laughs> right. Hey, we all need that. I keep a lot of this stuff bottled in me. I really, I really used to not really talk about what I did or who I was or anything like that. But when I went live and I got buzzed, I really vented and kind of. Like this podcast here, me venting information. I was doing that on bar sessions, and I had a lot, a lot of hist- a lot of knowledge with some of the. Rec- I would just spill beans like, "Oh yeah, this is my favorite group from Ohio on the right pressing plant." And then people were like live asking me questions back, like, "What? What do you mean the right press?" Because I was just blurting shit out, thinking they knew what I was talking about, you know. Because people sometimes think that, like, I used I took for granted that people knew what I was talking about, but they really didn't. So people were asking me questions like, what's the right pressing plant? Like, what are you talking like pressing plant? So I had to get into detail about it. So it was really informative for people who were watching. And people who were watching were really uh, into the vinyl and into the music that I was playing. They were yeah. really into the oldies. So here you got a guy who's, like, giving some history and some information on certain songs that, that were, like, no one really got. Um, it was a cool little show. So I started inviting on f- collector friends. I had a friend hit me up. Hey, man. Can I go like he can, I actually you know what my friend came over with his box of records and I said, you know what? Let's go live. So now I was kind of interviewing him and fucking he's like, I'm testing his knowledge and talking to him about his, what he knows about it. And I'm, st- I'm at the same time. We're like kind of schooling each other live. Everybody's watching this happen. And it really caught on, man. And then I started making these cheesy flyers. It started becoming like a weekly thing. And I started having other collectors come, but I didn't way in Marino Valley, bro. So a lot of collectors really didn't get a chance to come over to my house. A few did make the journey. Hey, and you know what? For the record, anybody that was a fan of that show, trust me, it would still be going. But dog, yeah. literally, the city got involved. This is how lit it was. Yeah, the city got involved. <laughs> they started making us want to, uh, buy, like a buy an entertainment license, like all this shit. Like if we were a legit club, right? And we we're like, no, we're we're just filming a pot. Like it this got is lit, a, yeah, this dog. Bro. And and they literally the city came after us. That's how lit the shows were. So anybody, man, you guys got to go check those no, out. And if to this day, honestly, on our YouTube channel, where they're still on our YouTube channel, it's just B side channel on YouTube. Th- those videos still always get watched, like to this day. It's really? Like two, three, yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. So watched. you guys go Make check sure that you out. Make sure you check it out. Yeah, yeah, man. Go check those out, man. Yeah. Uh, it happened right here at the B side. Literally, we made a bar 
you know. So, anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm this food like had somebody here making a, make a legit bar. bar. I recorded that too, yeah. by the way. Yeah. The whole how it all started. I got footage of that. Yeah. So in 2017, I was doing that for my house in Reno Valley for a good couple months, and I was like, you know what? What the fuck am I doing? Like, it's not what you know. Sometimes it's who you know. And fucking B side was had their their hip hop platform, but I've known Rabbit so good. Yeah. I'm like, I pitched them this idea. I said, bro, what if I like have my own show like on a Sunday? Cause they, you guys weren't and, doing and nothing. It, and at first, it started slow. Like I was like, all right. Like, and then I, I, and I'll be honest, I was like, is he serious? And then I knew you were. And then it's like, let's do it. Yeah. That shit took off, bro. And, oh, and shout outs to the bartender man, K Vicious. Kina. Yeah, K Vicious, Kina. Kina, oh, yeah. man, she's uh, hold it down. The, too, dope, man. the dopest bartender yeah, ever, yeah. bro. Like and she. play, we play live. You make sure you guys do go check those out, man. If you guys. W- Either weren't here or didn't get to watch it live. It, it was or if you don't know shit. what it is, it's just type in on YouTube uh, bar sessions at B side or bar sessions. Yeah, if you go on our B side channel on YouTube, there's actually a, a playlist. With if you go to our playlist, bar sessions is one of the playlists. So look, listen. so that happened for about what a year, almost uh, a year. Yeah, and that the only reason it stopped like, again, the, it got ci- too late. the city got involved. <laughs> so you were <laughs> asking me what's my favorite, favorite episode. episode? What can you think offhand? What, what was Matt, the okay, best one? I think they were all mine. Yeah, yeah, you yeah honestly, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think the most memorable episodes, of course, when uh, the f- was the first one, right? With Sick Jack. Oh yeah, yeah. Dmar. That really set dude. It that off. that set it off, bro. That's at the tone. What up, homie? That was a great. Yeah, Look at yeah. Uh, shout out, Jack, man. All you do. That was man, a great. D-Mar. That that was like getting all the heavy hitters that were, and still are relevant. To get them all in one room at my bar session, bro, to play. Because well, people knew when I played at my house at my bar top, I was trying to get the collectors involved, the heavy guys. So hey, when I came here, it was like it was closer to everybody because we're in Covina. So and it also made it like, you know, even though it's this, it's basically the same thing. It's almost like, you know, what, this is an actual location. Like, it, yeah, it, it's it, a to spot. them, maybe it's a little more official. But yeah, it was I was going to say I was going to say that, like. The thing was, is it, it was a, a fucking great blend of of uh, of ed- uh, education right. on the scene. Um, some fun, some drinking, good insights. Live drinking. Yeah, yeah, live drinking. We're literally sitting at the bar drinking, yeah, having a hard, good time, man. playing the music. Of yeah. course, the music's always the most important. Oh, the music important. was the best. But bro. then getting some little tidbits and insights yeah because like i said you, you had you had a veteran you know i've been doing this since 96 so i was constantly spewing anything somebody would play i would kind of like put my spin on what it was and sometimes they knew too these collectors i'm not the only knowledgeable collector oh no yeah some there's of them plenty were on it, yeah. of heavy knowledgeable collectors that were also sh- doing what i was doing sharing their knowledge and those are the best conversations yeah th- those are those are heavy man shout out to gj dj gummy too uh, also helping us yeah yeah gummy yeah, yeah that's right actually, shout out to yeah. DJ gummy. and you know what and i'm gonna say this on the record bro like eventually we're gonna bring that back i mean i don't i would love to i don't that. i don't Maybe know here yeah i was just gonna say <laughs> i don't know if we could do it here and get away with it but we definitely want to bring that back in some form or fashion um, you know, bro. especially hopefully things start to open back up and shit. Yeah, man, we'll I, figure I, it out. I got my house in Whittier now. I'm living in Whittier, and that bar is in my garage, and I go live on that bar oh, to this so day. Oh, there it is. I don't call it bar sessions though, or I don't. You know, I don't make a big old thing. You know what? Because it'll never be. It'll never be that bar. Set, but I do go live. People do know the bar. Well, you know how we can make people it do a, recognize we'll it. We'll make huh? it official. Yeah. I'll, ju- I'll just go over there and get all fucked up, and there it is. Pass out in your garage, and then it's like a fi- yeah, hey, it's new go. bar right? sessions. Music thing. I'm yeah. fucked up. Or we can I'm faded. Yeah, man. So hey. That bar has has had many legends hey. on it. Hey, listen, man. Um, in this scene, we we appreciate you coming through. Um, Thank you, man. Yeah, I'm dog. We we had, we obviously we have more to talk about, and that, that's what I'm saying. We're gonna figure out a way to bring it back, like where we could talk about. We we need music knowledge. I always like music knowledge, bro. That's something. Um, right. That I've, uh, entertainment in general for me, because that's why we also film the show and record it. But, um, man, shout out to everybody um, that is still just fans of music and wants to hear these tidbits and these little stories. and The backstory. Yeah, man, everything, like bro, about how things came about. Um, I, think that's impo- I think that's important, man, to talk about how things came about, at least from my experience. I, I've never claimed to like be the only guy. All I could do is just share with you my experience. And and, and, doing, and the thing is, is in the in this uh industry like people do want to hear your experiences so i hope so man i'm, I'm glad dope. to hear that i hope you know especially now yeah there's a lot of new collectors um there's a lot of different politics now in the whole collecting scene 
I, like, like you say, man, I got plenty of other ideas for the future. I'm not really worried about the politics right now of, of everything. Yeah. As long as I just got to keep doing what I'm doing. And, Thank you, and, bro. And, and keep it authentic. We have to it. keep moving too. Like, like yeah. even with this shit here, I mean, we're we're one of the most like I mean, I feel the most positive places where you could come here. Either so, you know, watch, tune in, come to kick it, listen to some music, get some knowledge, and all that. And it and it's uh, again, we keep it pushing, even though um, negativity sometimes gets involved. You know, we're just have we have, we got yeah, our man. own thing here, dog. And like, yeah. Sometimes things come into play, and it's like, but it ain't going to stop us, dog. We're going to keep moving forward. Now, I just want to – we end the show with some random shit sometimes, and I, I just – it was just funny to me today, and I was just thinking today of, like, if, if you could think of a worse movie that you ever saw, and maybe one that, um, that like, you kept watching even though it sucked. And I have one, and that's, of course, why I came up with it. I don't know if you have any off top, Shay, but – yeah, I'll, worst movie. I'll, man. I'll go. I, hey, go look, ahead. Listen. What's your worst movie? And I don't want to say. <laughs> listen, listen. Here's my disclaimer. I don't want to say worst movie like, like uh, that you've I, ever seen. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't want to say it like I'm. I'm faulting. Like this was an independent film, and it was just something that it was just random to me. And it was called. <laughs> the guy who made it is the guy from Blood In, Blood Out. Uh, Miklo. Miklo. Okay, shout out to me. Because he's dope. I, I, he he yeah. makes independent films now. He's a director and everything, okay, even I though did. besides being an actor. But yeah. this movie was just so I, I ended up watching it one time and it was called like I think it's called El Padrino or something. And I was watching it, dog, and it's like it was so way out, but it was one of those movies where I, I kept watching it and it had that girl uh what's her name? Uh Jennifer Tilly, I think her name is. Ooh. Oh yeah. Nice. She yeah. but she played a chola. Okay. I can see that. Yeah, I'm, I can't. Like, oh. I, I, <laughs> watch well, the movie. I, I got to see how horrible yeah, yeah, it is. No, watch the movie. Okay, if it's no, over, Jennifer John. Tilly's dope. Don't get yeah, me yeah, wrong, yeah. but they had her. She was a chola in oh, this movie, man. and it was it was a crazy, it was a trippy ass movie, and it was just like we're on some random shit towards the end of the show, but it was just like it came to my head today, and <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it, I, and I'm not gonna lie, I watched the whole <laughs> shit like. <laughs> So it you're was talking like about you're talking about the best worst movie. Yeah, yeah, I guess because uh, usually when a movie's bad, I'll just stop watching. No, it. I, maybe that's hey, what it was. The whole it's thing, so man. bad, it's good. Yeah, like, yeah. is that what it is yeah. then, Shay? Because yeah, I literally I was watching, going, "What the fuck?" And then I, but I watched the whole. I think maybe shit. Starship Troopers is kind of like the. It's kind of like. It's kinda Way like out ridiculous on some other I still shit. Watched it a few times. <laughs> Starship Troopers. Um, uh, what do you think? Okay, well, I was raised on some crazy B side movies that my dad and my Theos used to watch. They would watch some way out shit in the late seventies, early eighties, like you know, like the uh, like you know, they were into like the zombie movies, all the Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, oh, yeah. all those like gory, like yeah. low budget type movies. But I remember watching this one, and I think it was called Maniac, bro. It was like a low budget, rated B. The main character, his name was Frank, uh, and that was just one of the craziest, like weird holy old shit. Movies ever. Hey, he, he used, he used to like seen. rape mannequins yes. or some oh. shit, bro. <laughs> It was like the <laughs> crazy. <laughs> See, this is what I was on it, and just by you saying that, it reminded me oh, of another fuck. best worst movie. Oh, and man. this was earlier, like late '80s, maybe. Or, I don't. I think it was late '80s, but it was called Basket Case, and it was another one of those. Oh, I think I seen like, that. It's like, like, it's it, like a head in a yes, basket. Yes, it was a head. Dog, and he used to <laughs> pop out and yeah. attack people right, right, right. out of a basket. Dog, it was just a head. Yeah. Hey, bro, and it was a real movie. This came out in the theaters. And it was like, wow. I, a dog, it was a horror flick, but there's just shit that came to mind randomly, bro. I, I like some of these movies um, are still like probably cult classics, <laughs> but it's just at the time when I'm watching them, I'm like, what the fuck is this? And I end up still watching it. dog. <laughs> so shout out to these guys. I, I wanted to do, uh, I guess my point of that is like independent, um, like as all of us are in this room, independent. Um, always trying to kind of push the envelope, right. create new things. Uh, shout out to the homie Drac, man. He even put a movie out th uh, this past year at the beginning of the oh year. Word. Um, yeah. yeah uh, what's the, uh, the title again? Uh, uh, the Inner Demon. So yeah. yeah we're Crazy we're Race Directed. Basically a film oh, okay. division of the Crazy Race Directed? Wow. Yeah, yeah. They're doing a B side film. So it's just, I guess what I was getting at is uh, keep pushing, man. No matter what you guys All are man, doing, I, man. I, on Instagram, that's what I say, man. Keep yeah. going. Just don't look back. Just keep going. Speaking of all these like independent movies and all this movie talk, um, I'm in the process. Of, I don't know if you guys know, but in 2014, uh, you know, we we tried to do a uh, a documentary 
on the whole oh, soul yeah, scene. Right. I remember. Yeah, Sick Jack was like really like the front man pushing for it, like kind of representing, vouching for us yeah. on this documentary. A whole lot of crazy shit happened about um, why it never really came out. We still have footage. We're still working on it, believe it or not, six years later. And just let the cat out the bag, man. We're really getting serious and talking to independent movie makers. And we feel the time is right because this this vinyl culture, rare soul oldies underground, it just it's a this culture's like it's insane. If you if you guys just look around on Instagram, you'll see it. Yeah. Um there's really no there's really no authentic documentation of it or story uh, of it. But rest assured your boy's involved in the making of a documentary slash maybe movie. Uh I don't I can't really say a date or day of when it's coming out. But uh, there's definitely talks. We're it's definitely having meetings with with producers and fuck yeah, mo- and movie. It's good to hear makers. that type of shit here, dog, because that's what as a platform we <laughs> like to show people, bro. That yeah. like here's where you're gonna hear it's shit. People are moving and working and independent. Yeah, exactly. They might not be the you know the the you know platinum whatever the fuck you know million viewers on uh, on YouTube whatever it might be. But there's people. We're out here working. And there's an audience for this shit, dog. People definitely want to fucking feel yeah, the authentic and the real, bro. Not right, yeah, because half of the audience that's really that's really going bananas and, and really in, involved in this culture, like it's sad to say, man. Maybe seventy five percent of them don't even know the roots or how it came to be. I mean, in their own mind, they may they may think they know, like, oh, I heard that song on YouTube, but they don't know the actual how it really ended up on YouTube. Or who's really behind that release, or who did this and who contributed that? It's all about paying respect to who contributed what to to the scene, and, and, that's and how everybody just it, it's loved so much by everybody, but a lot of people ain't getting the fucking pay due credit. But and that's where they can tune in to shows like you know the the, the bar soul, session, bar session, soul, soul one hundred one podcast, all that shit, and, and on podcast here, I'll push yes, it. dog. And even us, we're we're just trying to show people like there's a lot of stuff. If you're if you're interested, you're gonna learn something. You know what I'm saying? Shay, you got something to say before we tail uh, it off? Oh yeah, just real quick. Um, thanks for everybody that's tuned in, and, and also just a reminder. Um, you can hit the link in, in my bio and Rabbit's bio. Rabbit season one. Uh, it's uh, I'm Shay Whitey, B side show. That bio will lead you to all our links, so you can catch this podcast. You can catch the B side show on all the platforms we're on now. We're on at least four or five. Catch platforms. that bar sessions too. Yeah, yeah, bar sessions is on there, and then also the, YouTube, uh, Switch, Twitter, t- Twitter uh, Twitch, uh, uh, Periscope, know, Twitter, Spotify, and uh, then also our, our email link is there. So if you need, um, you know, we ha- also offer creative space for podcasting and stuff like that. We have studio space, um, you know, live streaming. So if you hit the email in there, you could hit us up and find out, you know, what we offer, and you know, we'll, we'll and it back and especially you. also we're pushing, you know, uh, during this time, which is still going on, with virtual shows too. Yeah. We're a spot Word. where you can get at that, yeah. too. Oh, real quick, just a, a r- real quick shout out. Uh, uh, matter of fact, speaking on that, um, we just did one la- uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Shout out to the, uh, the big homie Madman, uh, UNG Radio. They did a comedy stream here, oh, so sick. which is also on our channel. You can check that Part out. Part of the vote, Circle know. of Bosses, Horseshoe yeah. Gang, yeah, horseshoe you know gang. what I mean? But he's doing Dr. his J. thing, Paul definitely. Gang was they here. did a comedy uh, award show here, and uh, shout out to them, man, because that's fam right there, man. I'm telling you, black and brown all day, we're... We've been no, doing yeah. moves behind the <laughs> scenes, man, and, you know, despite what the... It's all going to come to light, man. Yeah. All, the, all the stuff behind the scenes is meant to come to light. Yeah, man. Speaking of this hip-hop forum, man, um, I'm actually doing a beat EP. I'm not going to name any producers that are involved because it's not official official, but Yee. there's definitely uh, uh, this compilation series, man. I'm going to go ahead and say it because it's my own shit, but this has a heavy influence in the soul scene. I'm not saying it's the only influence. I'm just saying it has a big influence in the soul scene and soul collectors and whatnot, Gangsters Go Harmony. So I'm doing l- uh, all the music on here. Uh, I'm going to do a quick little EP, and I'm going to take some of my favorite hip-hop sounding uh, rare soul music, and I got four different producers to make four different beats Fuck yeah. to do a tribute to pay homage to the Gangsters Go Harmony series. Kind kind of like kind of like the that kind of like Sick Jackin's Drug Lab Soul. That, that, that that's like gonna get the shit like cracking where it crosses over. Shout even out to Sick Jack and, even and more and than Cynic. it has. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Sick Jack now, and Cynic for doing those vinyl drops and and, and keep and keep and, and 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 what they're doing, man, with the with the dive bar assassins, bro. The, that whole new sound that. Jack oh, I and, got that one too. And, yeah, and Waxy yeah. Gordon. Waxy, what up, homie? What's up, Waxy? Yeah, shout dog. Out to Wax. Hey, uh, uh, any shout outs, man? Real quick before we end the show, man. Man, everybody, I, 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 I 
you know, you can't say a certain name and then someone gets They're going to get mad at you, Yeah, you dog. didn't say my name, dog. So shout out to everybody who fucks with me, man. I fuck with you back. Shout out to all you guys who support um, the movement, man, the soul and culture. I'll, and I'll even, culture. Take it, I'll even take it a step further, man. Everybody that don't fuck with us, man. Uh, don't yeah, wor- shout out to you, Wait, man. don't worry. You'll come around. Fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for real. We're talking to him like that. George, man, thank yeah. you for coming through, brother. This is the Rabbit Season Podcast, man. We're going to be back weekly. We're going to have a wider range of guests. We already got a lot of dope confirmations, but it's anything Sick. from hip-hop. Obviously, now you see we got soul uh, actors, uh, athletes. We're going to have it all, man. So uh, I really appreciate my brother right here. I've known this guy for a long time. We're like fam and shit. Hey, uh, we need like three more podcasts. Yeah, oh, there. no, but that's <laughs> what we're going to do. We're going to have to bring back. And what we'll do is we'll we'll make it specific to maybe topic. telling a story yeah, yeah a topic yeah but today we just wanted to get you guys you know Familiar a, a little bit of knowledge of uh, george miller jr the vinyl life Thanks, man brother. and yeah yes. man i mean that's my name the vinyl life i yes. mean what does that tell you right there man i'm all about it all about it man thank shout you out guys to B-Side, shout, shout out to rabbit and shape shout out to you guys shout out to everybody who fucks with me shout out to everybody who don't fuck with me like rabbit like rabbit said man you'll come around you'll come around don't worry yeah, you'll come around we, we got you guys man oh and shout out the whole team man eclipse man uh shots fired kevin man uh, everybody contributes my brother shay whitey uh producer and co-host of this show uh thank you guys again um all of our fam please make sure you guys repost uh support we appreciate you again and we'll see you next time peace peace